Hello, and welcome to 2022 and the very first slow chat with none other than Ross Cameron. So we are guaranteed an interesting conversation, an animated conversation. Who knows? We might get on each other's nerves. We might argue with each other. We might be in furious agreement with each other. If you've ever watched a slow chat before, you know that none of that matters because what it's really all about is one of these. Well, for me anyway. I mean, that's that's what it's all about for me. Now, listen, it's the start of a new year and I feel the need to reestablish some ground rules that I think got lost a little bit over the the Christmas New Year period. I've been reading the comments on my Facebook page, on Instagram, etc. And there's just something that I want to address that I know most of you will already know. Most of you are completely across this, but it might come as a shock to a minority of people based on the comments that I'm reading. And here's what I have to say. You're not my real dad, okay? Let's just get this really, really clear right from the outset. Uh, some of you have uh, have been objecting to these. I've been putting up little snippets and replays of past ones. Let me let me school you a little bit. This right here. This is the reason you're watching me right now. Even if you hate this, this is the reason you're watching me right now. And this is important. This isn't just about me and my cigars. This is a bigger picture point that I want to make here, based on these things. It takes a certain kind of personality to be willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the police weekend after weekend in standing up for human rights when the government wants to crack down on them. It took a certain kind of personality in the form of Ignaz Semmelweis to stand up for basic hygiene and the washing of hands to try and save women's lives. He was a notoriously grumpy, cantankerous man who ended up dying having been committed to an insane asylum because of the intensity of the letters that he had written, passionately pleading for doctors to actually start washing their hands. It takes a certain kind of outlier personality to be willing to do the kinds of things that I do. And this is a symptom of my somewhat outlier, uh, you could say outsider, in honor of my guest tonight, uh, personality that, that you have to have in order to do what I do. Don't come in here telling th or thinking, don't come in here thinking that I'm going to care about your opinion on my cigars, but I'm going to stand my ground when there's armed police officers, agents of the state at my door, right? Don't think I can be both of those things at once. I'm not. I'm somebody who stands for what I believe in and does what I believe to be right for me. And I stand for your right to make the same decisions for you and stand for what you believe to be right. But do not presume that I give a rat's ass what you think of my smoking cigars. We clear? Ground rules established? Good. Excellent. Let's move on. Now, my guest tonight, Ross Cameron. Uh, look, if, if you're not familiar with Ross, welcome. You're going to have fun tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. This is this is a, absolutely uh, a, a treat for me. I've had some wonderful guests before. Uh, Ross Cameron adds to that list. Now, I have to warn you up front, if you missed out on the comfortable spot on the couch, you're going to regret that because, well, listen, the record for Slow Chats is now in excess of four hours. We've gone till after midnight before. There is a risk that we might challenge that. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I might, I might chicken out in sort of three hours. I'm, I might not be up for it. I might not have the stamina. Who knows? But you know what? There's a risk. So I hope you've got the comfortable spot on the couch. I hope you've got yourself uh, a bottle of something nice. This is what I'm on tonight. I'm on a bit of a, uh, a bit of a bender with Australian whiskies at the moment, and this is the one that I'll be sipping on tonight. And my cigar of choice is the Mark Twain Riverboat. It's called a barber pole. You see that um, they've actually used a Maduro and a Connecticut wrapper on the same cigar. It gives it a really interesting and, and dense kind of flavor. Uh, so that's what I'll be enjoying tonight. Without any further ado, let me bring on my wonderful guest, Ross Cameron, and ask, of course, the most important question that we are all hanging on. Ross, welcome. G'day, Tyler. The most important question that everyone is hanging to have answered is, "What are you drinking tonight?" Well, I've got um, I've got a I've got a double banger, two options. Um, just as my stock standard um, tall glass with lots of ice, um, mm. soda water, and a splash of Bixford Bixford's lime. 
Okay. Yeah. And then adjacent to that, uh, in a short uh, crystal grass with quite a bit of ice, I just have a bog standard uh, Johnny Walker double black label. Okay. Just a Western Sydney boy. Nothing refined about this cat. <laughs> Fair enough. You say nothing refined. Um, you are notorious for your classical literature references and uh, your your uh, in-depth discussions of Marcus Aurelius, etc. And then you, you have the, the audacity to sit here and say, oh, nothing refined about me. Yes, of course there isn't. Well, you know, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a touch-up, you know, just sure. to get the high chat um, off. Uh, let's, let's kick off right from the beginning, shall we? Um, <laughs> you know, you did... Um, since we have to talk about me, uh, let's talk about me. Um, <laughs> don't you, don't pretend you, you don't enjoy it. Um, you sent out a um, on the invitation, you know, saying that I was classically educated. Well, that is in truth uh, a mistake of fact, and which, which is I, which is the most polite possible way of saying that I lied. I just yeah. I even in how you are touching me up, you are actually proving me correct. Um, <laughs> Perhaps and, not in fact, but in, in concept. Yeah. And so, you know, I had a standard Sydney uh, public school primary education. Which is to say none. Um, yeah, particularly. I mean, the school system was a little bit different 40 years ago than it is mm. today. <clears throat> um, but, you know, an Australian education today is really something one needs to recover from um, uh, <laughs> rather than acquire. Hey. I was homeschooled. You will get no argument from me. Yeah. Well, look, that would be, uh, I, I think we should just make a little post-it note, homeschooling, put it on the wall as a subject to return to. Okay, I I'd be happy to, yeah. Is a very fertile and interesting subject and one mm. worth discussing. And we could, indeed, Marcus Aurelius, uh, who you began with, was homeschooled. And mm. in his meditations in the very first chapter, which is entitled Debts and Thanks. He gives thanks to his father uh, mm -hmm. that he was not educated in the public school system of Rome. Yes. And indeed, um, later on in the meditations, uh, he says he learnt from, I can't remember whether it was um, Pius Antonius, his adoptive father, that... He learned that one should spend liberally um, on private tutors. Yes. Um, that Marcus, who was, in effect, the exact opposite of Josh Frydenberg, <laughs> you know, Marcus was a bloke who only liked to spend public money if it actually needed to be spent. Yes. Uh, yes. Marcus was not wandering out, writing out checks for $100 billion uh, to, you know, test out the temperature of the, of the River Tiber. <laughs> um, or of a coral reef 100 kilometres offshore. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. He said one should only, he learnt, um, again, I think it was from his adoptive father, to take a very, you know, a, an abstemious approach to the use of public money. And uh, he, um, but anyway, the, the point is uh, we mm -hmm. will return um, to the question of homeschooling. Indeed. Will do. Uh, you know, one of my other great uh, favourites. In fact, um, if we go to the library, we can get both of them um, right up front. We have... Yeah, in, Meditations in... and On Liberty. Yes, yes, yes. Now, okay. On so Liberty. I, I, I just finished rereading On Liberty. Okay, good uh, It had a forward by someone who decided to write 86 pages of forward for a book that is itself only 140 odd pages in the format that I that I bought it in, yeah. uh, so I, I did skip the forward. I will admit, but I've just finished rereading it, and I, I do have some thoughts and almost some questions. Which so let's let's put a pin in that as well. Let's okay. have let's have a quick chat about um, John Stuart Mill before we're done tonight well, look, as well. The reason why I bring up Mill um, is because I should actually be holding up a second work uh, of J.S. Mill. Okay. Which is less famous, um, but which without which you cannot really understand on liberty. And that okay. other work uh, by John Stuart Mill is called simply autobiography. And okay. 
Uh, the truth is, it is it's it's slightly misleading in its title, which is the only misleading bit about a thoroughly otherwise truthful book. Right. Uh, in that it's not a story of his life, but it's the story of his education. Yeah, okay. Interesting. What he calls his um, eccentric uh, and unusual education. And, you know, guys like you and me, and no doubt your beautiful audience, um, are lovers of the eccentric. Mm. Indeed, John Stuart Mill says in On Liberty, that eccentricity, the presence of eccentricity in a culture is like, um, it, it is the barometer of the presence of freedom in the culture. Yeah. The, I, the eccentric is the canary in the coal mine. I, I have to say that uh, rereading on Liberty, it was, it, it's been a long time since I read it and I've evolved a lot in my own political understanding and in who I am and my confidence in who I am. And rereading it now has given me a bit of a morale boost. I have to say, I, I feel a little bit better about myself and my weirdnesses, uh, having having reread that and gone, "Ha, there you go. <laughs> there is there is a place for me." Well, look, the um, you know my um, approach uh, to issues, which I love your idea of the slow chat. Mm. Uh, because my brain works um, in you know what Rowan Dean would would be looking at me nervously, saying, "You know, land it, land it, <laughs> land it bring it back. Where, where is this going?" You know? See, see, he's got ad breaks and timings to adhere to. Yeah. I have none of those. Yeah. Um, and so my brain works in what I would describe as an elliptical way. Mm -hmm. It kind of it, it goes out on its elliptical orbit. It does eventually make it back. Right. Uh, sometimes I get lost or forget or, um, you know, it's not perfectly reliable. The point um, is John Stuart Mill um, and Marcus Aurelius were both high schooled. John Stuart Mill never spent a day of his life as an enrolled student in a formal learning institution. There you go. Um, John Stuart Mill um, could not have been admitted to either Oxford or Cambridge because he would not subscribe to the 39 Articles of Religion. Right. Indeed, uh, John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill, who uh, is sort of like the Scotty Pippen to Michael Jordan. I mean, James Mill <laughs> is a very significant figure yeah. in, uh, in, in education, in economics, in philosophy, uh, and in history, being the author mm. of the history of British India. Um, but um, he, his, John, John Stuart Mill's father, James, was actually um, called to the clergy um, okay. But after being ordained, uh, he found himself, in effect, unable to really subscribe to the message he was required to sell. Yes. And, uh, you know, had that crisis of conscience, which is mm -hmm. not unique uh, to James Mill, when one mm -hmm. finds oneself in a role which requires holding a certain set of convictions and then finding, uh, you know, you couldn't do it. Indeed, my sort of second uh, bit of paid employment, my first paid work was as a paper boy. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I was 16, I got a job working at Ikea. Oh. And, but I was in the warehouse. I, did, I didn't know that Ikea was around in the 1700s. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it was... Um, Part of the uh, Swedish imperial strategy, you know. Ah, yes, of course. I read about that in history, in my homeschooled history. I, I read all about that, yes. But I had the experience where I only ever worked in the, uh, in the warehouse, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I had a beautiful yellow um, shirt, uh, blue jeans, um, mm -hmm. which I used to even iron with a certain amount of pride, even though it was probably poly cotton. Um, but nonetheless, um, on occasion, when they were short-staffed in the showroom, uh, I would get sent upstairs to stand on the showroom floor when the mm. place was packed. And I just remember this terrible feeling of people coming up to me and asking me about 
the features uh, of a Billy bookcase, um, which I had never done anything with except um, take off a pallet uh, and yeah. load onto a shelf. And I had to be uh, an expert on a product about which I uh, was untrained and knew very little. <laughs> and uh, I sort of resolved that in future, you know, my, my strong preference would be only to sell the product that I actually understood and, uh, and believed in. Well, which goes to, to the, the sort of um, conclusion of, of the sentence, which is that, you know, I had a pu Sydney public school primary education. I had a Sydney private school high school education. Mm. Spent one year uh, on exchange in the United States in a little town called Anderson, Indiana. Okay. Was a centre for the uh, manufacture of motor vehicle auto parts, which at one stage had the highest unemployment of any town in the United States. Wow. When, okay. when the Japanese arrived and the US auto industry was just getting smashed, mm. all the US auto parts makers were, you know, and this was a whole city, a town of 60,000, I guess a bit bigger than yep. Tamworth, about the same size as Tamworth. Um, yeah. And it just got whacked. But um, the truth is then I went and did two uh, two degrees at Sydney University. I did an economics degree and a law degree. And, you know, I, I shouldn't be too dismissive of it. That was an opportunity I appreciated. Mm. Uh, in truth, I would say pound for pound, it was an opportunity from which I benefited. Okay. But I would still say to you that Sydney University at that time was well, well into the slide, uh, mm. into the cultural collapse, into yeah. the kind of censorship of opinion, this intellectual authoritarianism, this total mm. intolerance for uh, dissent or for alternative views, this willingness to personally ostracise, to smear, um, mm. to isolate, uh, to, to um, you know, expel anyone who didn't, in effect, toe the line. And yeah. we learned early that if you wanted the marks, you needed to reflect back to the lecturer the uh, yeah. sort of Marxist, feminist uh, assumptions which were predominating at the time and which have only been more entrenched since then. Okay. Can, can, can I pause there for a moment? To what degree do you think the fact that universities capitulated and fell into exactly what you've just described, to what degree do you think that plays into the way governments are behaving now, particularly with, with COVID-19, the, the censorship of opposing opinion, etc.? Do you think the latter would have been possible without the former? Was there a causative relationship there or is it a, a um, uh, not a coincidence, but are, are they both, do they have a common cause that is independent of them? Well, now you're asking uh, asking the big questions, Topo. This uh, is a slow chat. We've got all night to answer them. I'm going to have to go to the Johnny Walker. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, while you have a think about that, uh, there's a very clever comment here. I don't know, Hale, I don't know if this was deliberate or not, um, but it, you've capitalised the and band. So I'm going to say it was deliberate. So instead of the band, as in the musical band, it's get <laughs> the band, as in people who have been banned, back together. Uh, yeah. Outside, it's going down the gurgler, controlled opposition. Look, I'm not going to go down the controlled opposition path. Um, yeah. You can share or not share your thoughts on on all of that as you see fit, mate. But I just wanted to give honour to uh, the way get the band back together. I think. Oh, it's it. Yes, um, I thought it was uh, was uh, worthy of note. Yeah. Well, look, if we're going to say, um, you know, I, I think it's a it, it's a good question, good and a fair question. Um, if we say. Um, you know, politics is downstream of culture, um, um, which I think is certainly the case. Um, and Will Durant, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author of Civilizations with his wife, Ariel, right. he accepts um, the implication of your question. He says that politics... Um, is the consequence of ideas which are formulated uh, in a classroom and in a lecture theatre. And um, I think if we if we go, take one step even further back sure. um, and, and say, 
you know, I, I, I will tell you frankly, although at the very same school as me um, in, in high school was a bloke named Mark Scott. Um, he was the sort of head of the debating team in sixth form when I was in, I think, first form. He's a little bit older than me. Mm. Um, but he's now the vice chancellor of Sydney University. The, the truth is... Um, Sydney University is nothing special in its rate of decline right. because we see it replicated across 40 universities. Right. Uh, Univers and, University of Queensland is a standout for me in that regard. Yeah. Look, I reckon if you can distinguish University of Queensland from the University of Technology, Sydney, from Sydney University, from James Cook University sacking um, yeah. people in yeah. career, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. for having a correct opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah, there should be a club for everyone who's been sacked for having the correct opinion. <laughs> um, in in honour of Hale Bop, we could call it the band. The band, yes, yes, yes yeah. the band. I like the band. Yeah, it is. It's um, great, isn't it? That's that's a good one. That's that's a keeper. Um, but what we so what we see is it's happening all over Australia. And you know, for example, if 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 I just give you, how do we know it's happening all over Australia? There's a couple of. Uh, canaries, if you like, litmus tests that, that mm -hmm. leap out at you. Um, one was when uh, Bjorn Lomberg, um, speaking of the Swedes, uh, who was the world authority on um, the cost of mm -hmm. climate change abatement, mm -hmm. the cost of the measures you adopt. Let's mm -hmm. say, as Bjorn Lomberg did, uh, that, that climate change is real. Now, just between, premise, yes. just, just between us girls, I think climate change is the greatest crock of shit I've ever heard in my life. Okay. I, it, it, I don't know if you're familiar with my work or not, um, yeah. but in, in the 50 to 1 project, I had to do a similar uh, thing to, to Bjorn Lomborg and take the premise that CO2 did actually affect the climate in the way that the IPCC claimed it did. And even if you give them that assumption, which I don't actually give them in reality, their solutions still don't make sense. So I would yeah. say it's not just a crock of shit, it is a multi-layered crock of shit yeah. <laughs> where the foundation is built out of shit, the walls are built out of shit, and the ceiling of shit has been placed on top. It's uh, it's 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 an earnings stream. And that, I think, we, we will return to this principle of the earnings stream um, and, and the logic of decline. Mm. But, you know, when, when Lomberg came out and said, look, I believe in climate change, um, but what I want to do is make sure that the money we spend on it, the citizen gets the best value for the yeah. money that we spend because we're going to spend a lot of money on this problem. Which, which How can that not be a default consensus position, even among governments that do think it's happening? Yeah. Isn't that just a, the most obvious approach? Yeah. So Lomberg rocks up and, you know, the Liberal government, I can't remember whose government it was, whether it was the one I was a member of or a subsequent one. I think it was a subsequent one. Might have been Abbott's. Um, but the government said, OK, we're going to tip in the first four million bucks <clears throat> um, to get this thing off the ground. So you'll have enough for, uh, you know, for three or four officers. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can employ half a dozen academics, a couple of administrative staff. This, this was his. What, what was that called? What was that? The he had a name for what he wanted to start. Yeah, um, I can't remember. One of your viewers will tell us. There can be yeah, a, the the, um, the Copenhagen Consensus Centre. Yeah, something like that. Something. But yeah, yeah. But he, he he wanted to ask the question: How do we make sure we spend this money to get the most bang for the buck? Mm. Well, and so the government, you know, easily found four million bucks, as governments do, and then 40 universities sat around, you know, shifting from one butt sheet to the other, uh, nobody wanting to put up their hand and say, please give us the four million bucks, mm -hmm. because none of them wish to in any way associate themselves with costing, um, you know, remediation of climate change. Yeah. They all wish to place themselves in the way of hundreds of millions, indeed billions, we find out, uh, since, you know, when, when I, I was absolutely shocked mm. when Josh Frydenberg, Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull 
right. um, turned up with a beer coaster and on the back of it, mm. 440 million Australian dollars to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. When I saw that, my, my, I was just like, I was speechless mm. by the Good. level of, um, uh, of obtuseness, by the mm. disconnection to the problems of the suburbs, by the complete breakdown of the relationship between the idea of a Liberal Party and fiscal responsibility. When you mm. can afford to give away $440 million dollars to a completely unknown foundation, which has just been established and has got a few mates of Malcolm from the, uh, you know, from the what US uh, Confusion Center at Sydney University, Malcolm and Lucy's <laughs> mates. Uh, it's run by some chick from the Queensland Opera, mm. uh, you know, who was looking for a job with an NGA but wouldn't recognize a coral reef if she fell onto it off the back of a boat. And $440 million. Now, what I didn't realise was, Pofa, uh, that was just the entree. Uh, that was not the main meal. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just the appetiser. And, you know, I, I say to uh, Scott Morrison um, and Josh Frydenberg, um, you know, if you want to be taken seriously uh, by anyone who is thinking about the future of this country, anyone who is thinking about the size of the debt that mm -hmm. our children are going to inherit. Anyone who is thinking about the level of weight you have got to load onto the average small business in mm -hmm. order to comply with local government, state government, federal government, taxes, charges, tolls, levies, imposts, duties, uh, regulations, um, etc. When you dream up a billion dollars to save the Great Barrier Reef, when, as you know, Ian Plymer, mm -hmm. uh, who is Emeritus Professor of Earth Sciences at Melbourne yeah. University, Australia's yeah. easily most decorated geologist, yeah. uh, when he <laughs> makes the observation that the vast majority of the Great Barrier Reef is over 100 kilometres offshore and is totally untouched and unaffected by anything that takes place in the Australian mining or farming industry, and yet we have now, in effect, Liberal, Labor and the Greens saying mm -hmm. shut down Queensland's Galilee Basin coal mining because it's a threat mm -hmm. to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, yeah. Not to mention what they're doing to farmers and primary producers with the restrictions on fertilisers that they can use and when they can use it and all that sort of stuff. I mean, the, the reef is being used as leverage, as a tool of manipulation that then is being used against a, a lot of different sectors, particularly in, in Queensland. Yeah. Um, th there was a comment that you made earlier that I wanted to come back to, um, but I might have to put a pin in that and come back to it when I can recall it because you've you've covered a couple of, of, of good things there, and I, I I'm I've lost. Okay, well I'll tell you this. Um, since you've made the mistake of giving me another opening, um, <laughs> um, we do have to thank uh, the Greens and Bob Brown's convoy in particular. Um, for the re-election um, of the Morrison government, right? The extent to which these sort of obtuse, um, uh, risk-protected laptop Zoom class of urban, you know, as Keating said, muesli crunching, sandal wearing, latte sipping. Um, hey, hey, there's uh, nothing wrong with lattes. Um, the rest of it can get in the bin, but there's nothing wrong with lattes. Yeah. You know, muesli is probably, is no doubt better than, uh, you know, the strangely uh, coloured things which otherwise come out of cardboard boxes and are described as breakfast cereals. Um, I, when I went to the US as a seven-year-old with the family, they had glow-in-the-dark breakfast cereal. I'm not making this up. <laughs> it glowed in the freaking dark. I have two questions. Number one, what is that doing to your insides? Number yeah. two, who the hell is eating their breakfast in the dark? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It makes no sense. Anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah. Um, well, look, I just want to say um, oh, where where that conversation began was about the fact that there wasn't one out of 40 Australian universities mm. who had any interest whatsoever in costing climate change, not one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I say, okay, um, you know, um, does this tell us these people are teaching science or 
these people are trying to get themselves in the way of a revenue stream uh, and don't wish to rock the boat. Um, you know, there was, um, if you wished now, I had a bit of a spat, a bit of a dispute with uh, the Reverend uh, Michael Spence, the former Vice Chancellor of my alma mater, Sydney University. Mm -hmm. um, when I said that, you know, it was a monoculture, it is not a place of learning, it's not a place mm -hmm. of inquiry, it is not a place of doubt, which is at the centre of the scientific method. Mm -hmm. um, but it is an authoritarian sort of intellectual kindergarten. Yeah. Uh, and he pushed back, uh, you know, in an um, article, Sydney Morning Herald, no doubt, written by his sort of 23-year-old public relations consultant. Um, but, you know, if I say to him, all right, I'd like to book a room to hold a, a rally for uh, the re-election of Donald Trump, um, you know, uh, I don't expect I, I, I don't expect I will require security to do that, will I, at an Australian university? Sure oh. not. These are open-minded people who understand the value yeah. of competing ideas and, uh, you know, liberal democracy. Absolutely uh, not a chance. Yeah. But we're seeing this, you know, we're, we're seeing the collapse of the, ac of the academy um, all over the Western world. And we see the Chinese now describe Australian universities as paper factories in that they're manufacturing paper degrees, but the degrees have, uh, have, have, have no meaning to them. And it, it's, one, it's one of the few things that I agree with China on. And, and can I chime in here and, and mention the fact that uh, those same universities that didn't want the money for Bjorn Lomberg's, I'm sure it was called the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Consensus yeah. Centre or something along that line, yeah. happily accepted money to have Confucius Institutes right. on their campuses. Yeah. Now, I, now, now this is where we should say, this is indeed is the moment I got sacked. Um, so we, we can have a little brief. Sorry, which time? Because I think you've been sacked a few times, haven't you? I have you? been sacked a few times. We, which sacking are we talking about um, here? And I just think if you've never been sacked. Oh, sorry. I don't know if that's your internet or mine, but you've just broken up. Um, can a viewer just chuck a comment in and let me know, am I the one freezing or is that Ross? Um, sorry, did I, did I freeze for you, Ross? No, you were beautiful for me. I froze I'm for me. I'm always but... beautiful, Ross. I'm yeah. always beautiful. Uh, okay. So I, I think your internet might be a little bit dodgy. Well, that's okay. About, can, have you, am I stable now or not? Yeah. 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 All good now. Okay. I'm a stable genius. Uh, as a, great <laughs> a very stable genius. Um, <laughs> Look, I am uh, of the various. We could go through and make a list of where uh, where are the matters on which TOFA is unorthodox, mm -hmm. um, and we could ask that question in relation to um, you know the world. We know where you are because of, for example, a beautiful work of art that you have created. <laughs> Uh, which is really, as you say, which the Australian people have created, mm -hmm. telling mm -hmm. the story of the destruction. They wrote the story, I just told it. Of, of the quality of life of one of the world's great cities. Um, mm -hmm. But if I say to you the harder question, um, so we know that in our culture's moment of need, mm -hmm. we know that um, you are standing up to the machine, um, you know, Topher is the Chinese guy standing uh, in front of the tank uh, in the... Uh, it's it's probably a little bit generous, but I, I understand the, the, the metaphor. Um, but I can give you a list of the questions. Let's say that you and I broadly belong to the same tribe. Mm -hmm. And that tribe is, you know, we, is relatively loosely defined. Uh, because that's the kind of that's the nature of the tribe Absolutely. is we, we we want to create space for each other, not mm -hmm. lock each other in to yeah. immovable positions. Yep. Yep. Um, but nonetheless, um, we were talking about the university sector, which was mm. established and created by Plato, mm. uh, who established the very first academy, uh, and you know a kilometre away, uh, Aristotle in emulation of his teacher uh, created the Lyceum. Um, 
but um, you know, Plato's teacher Socrates said we must follow the argument like a ship blown on the water wherever the facts may lead us. Sure. And I think if we if we do that for all of us, I think is more of an aspiration uh, than a fact. We would all like to think uh, that we are objective, uh, that yes. we are willing to follow the fact, mm -hmm. but all of us make a kind of compromise uh, with our own interest, um, yep. with the interests of the people we love and care about, um, yep. and with the status quo. So why don't you tell me? I will tell you I am um, heterodox. On China. Mm -hmm. I okay. am pro China. Okay. I am, I love the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. um, I will argue, I would say that uh, Xi Jinping uh, is the second most rational actor on the world stage after Vladimir Interesting. Putin. Interesting. Okay. So I am on both of those, on both Russia and China. I mean, yep. I am uh, heterodox. Yep. Um, I am heterodox. Now, on this audience, it would be very interesting to do a poll yeah. uh, of Topher's audience and say, where do we stand on mm. the freedom, uh, the dignity, the honour of uh, Julian Assange, mm -hmm. uh, who has just been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I uh, would like to be uh, first speaker for the affirmative. Um, sure. Yet I know opinion, I recognise opinion on that subject is divided. Even divided. Though, let's say, you know, or, or let's say we describe ourselves somewhere between conservative and in, in the Edmund Burke sense and libertarian in the John Stuart Mill sense. That's where I feel sure. myself. Right. Uh, I would go back a bit further than that, but just for a, a rough modern you know, yep. contemporary. Um, well, there's room for difference. So why don't you tell me, you've just told your audience your dissent on cigars. Yes. Um, <laughs> or you dissent in that you certainly say you don't expect to dictate the health choices of your audience and they may, and any member of your audience may attempt to uh, purse their lips and clutch their pearls about yours, but uh, you are uh, indifferent um, to the views of others on those questions. Where yeah. else is Topher unorthodox? What will you confess to? Look, on a number of things, um, I, I am I am somewhat um, interested in Vladimir Putin uh, and open to the idea that he is um, certainly one of the more rational actors. Um, that doesn't necessarily make him benign, um, but when it comes to Xi Jinping, I, I will declare a, a contrast to you. I, I follow quite closely, actually, a friend of mine and a previous guest on a slow chat, uh, Dr. Paul Monk, who is a former head of the Defence Intelligence Organization's China Division, and it was his responsibility to, uh, to assimilate all the information from China. Now, he was retired from that role before Xi Jinping came to power. Uh, but I've been following his work. He writes regularly in The Australian. I've been following his work and chatting with him from time to time uh, about it. So I, 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 I find myself wary of China, although I, in contrast to my younger self, uh, I, I would like to go back in time and give my younger self a good solid bitch slap because my younger self was quite keen on the idea of wars to, uh, to pull you know, various state actors into line. In fact, when I was in recruit course for the Army Reserve, um, that was when... North Korea detonated their first nuclear bomb and we knew for a fact that they had the bomb. And I remember with a tinge of shame now looking around at the other recruits, the only media we got to see was a half an hour of news during our, our dinner time. And there it was, the bomb, the North Korea's got it. And I remember looking around at the other recruits and the talk amongst us was we're going to get sent to North Korea to kick Kim Jong-un's ass because that was, you know, it was Kim Jong-un at the time. And being excited at the prospect and feeling like, yes, I'm going to get to go and you know, make the world a better place by going and killing a bunch of people. Um, so I've changed a lot since then. Um, but I, I, I still find myself wary of China, although I am certainly not interested in a war with them. I'm not interested in Australia getting wrapped up in Ukraine with what's happening with, with Russia. Uh, and if you're across that in any deep sort of way, then I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I'm not across that with any depth uh, at all, only really what's in the media in terms of what's happening in, in Ukraine. Uh, in terms of areas where I am, I'm certainly not orthodox. 
uh, would certainly be climate change. That's one that I've been very, very public about. Um, but also, I would say the role of government generally. So to give you some more examples, uh, I grew up believing that Johnny Howard was basically second only to Jesus. You know, there was God the Father, there was God the Son, and then there was God the, the, the cousin in the form of Johnny Howard. Um, and, and when he said that we needed to have a baby bonus to encourage people to have babies, yes. When he said we had to have a, uh, a first home owners grant to help new home buyers get into the market, absolutely fantastic. Uh, when he said we needed to ban guns, I felt a tinge of sadness because I've always kind of liked guns, even from my, my early teenage mm -hmm. years. Uh, but nevertheless, if Johnny Howard says it, then that's what we've got to do. I now consider all three of those to have been catastrophic mistakes of, of policy, catastrophic catastrophic failures of, of policy. Um, and so I, an, an area where I'm certainly not orthodox in the Australian community is I have no issue with private ownership of guns. And I think it should be permitted even for the purpose of self-defense. I think that that should be a completely legitimate reason for someone to own a gun and to have a gun in their home. That puts me in a very small percentage of Australians. That is a very unorthodox view within Australia. Uh, I'm unorthodox on climate change. Uh, I'm, un I'm unorthodox. Sorry? Go yeah, go ahead. I'm unorthodox on uh, education, being a big advocate for homeschooling. And I think you should only go to university if you know what you want to do and you need that piece of paper. If that's the case, absolutely, go to university. Fantastic. <laughs> I, I don't want to drive across a bridge that wasn't designed by someone who knows how to do engineering. I don't want to have brain surgery by someone who wasn't properly trained. There is a place for high education, high levels of education. But to have it be the default as though you failed because you didn't go to university at all or to have these, these institutions churning out um, arts graduates, I, I think is, is a, a horrible misallocation of, of resources. Let me derail your question, your, your question by going back because I remembered what I was going to say before. You mentioned Bjorn Lomborg, and I want to commend to everyone watching and everyone who watches this in future, I want to commend Bjorn Lomborg, um, uh, Hans Rosling, the uh, statistician, and also Matt Ridley as three people who their default starting point is to accept the status quo. They accept the proposition that climate change is a problem. They accept the proposition that certain things are a problem, but then they apply an intensely rational approach to solutions or, or actions that we should then take as a result. And I found that even though I disagree with their premises on a lot of issues, I have found them actually very, very educational and very, very um, thought provoking in their responses to that. That was what I had forgotten earlier that I, that I wanted to bring up. So anyway, well, I, have I have I answered your question regarding unorthodox? Yeah, look, I give you I give you points um, for if we're talking about being heterodox with our own um, audience, with mm -hmm. our own tribe. Yeah. You know, I think for me, um, the thing I admire in others is a willingness to um, articulate the point of view that nobody wants to hear. Yes. And, um, you know, that point of view will differ from one audience to the next. But the point of view that, that is true that nobody wants to hear or that is at least as good as the current thesis, but nobody wants mm. all the thesis. Mm. And so I give you points especially for homeschooling. Um, even though I was not homeschooled, sure. uh, I haven't homeschooled my own kids so far. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try not to hold that against you. Um, I try. reckon that homeschooling is a growth stock. Mm. And if we, are to, if we were to say um, what is the single most malignant and toxic organisation uh, in Australia today, which is not run out of a prison, Right. Um, you know, we, we, we may speculate, uh, we may put together a straw poll. Um, I think um, Sydney University is a very uh, toxic place today mm. and is a significant net uh, cultural liability as the entire uh, university sector. Mm. I mean, the ABC is a pretty toxic place, but we learn, you know, the recently that Channel 10 is, in terms of its culture, is, you know... Mm. Basically, it's the same material. Well, I, I, I would argue that journalism generally is a fairly closed shop. 
Yeah. You, you you don't get to graduate and call yourself a journalist unless, like you said, you can reflect back to the lecturers what they would like to hear and the kinds of persuasions yeah. and points yeah. of view that they would like to hear. Yeah. Well, this is the, there is obviously a, when you say to me, you know, what, what, what are we, I've worked for, I've worked for the ABC as a contracted uh, regular on radio, television, and um, online. Yeah. Uh, I worked for um, the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, yep. writing, writing columns for them for two years. Yeah. Uh, then I spent five years with uh, Murdoch at yep. Sky. Um, yep. I'm not really uh, the sort of inveterate uh, media guy. I sort of sure. fell into media um, almost by accident later on in my life. Okay. But <clears throat> what we now see uh, is two quite distinctive spheres of media. There is um, what is alternatively called, uh, you know, mainstream media. Uh, it might be otherwise described as legacy uh, media. It might be described yeah. as um, approved uh, media or blue uh, media. Yeah. Yeah. We might describe it as those who are in the racket. Um, <clears throat> you know, famously, uh, I would say it's, so, only, it's only a racket if you're not in it. Uh, uh, by the way, on the blue ticks, uh, I've been denied blue ticks on every platform that I've tried to get one on. Yeah. I have 50,000 followers on Facebook. Yeah. I have millions of views on my videos across multiple different platforms. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that is not enough for Facebook to deem yeah. me to be a real actual person who is of public interest. Sure. But, but there are many other blue ticks that have a fraction of the track record. Yeah. And look, I have... Um, yeah, well, over what well, let's say twenty odd thousand um, followers on uh, Twitter. Sure, I've never applied uh, for a blue tick uh, mm -hmm. because once they stripped Julian Assange, who was easily the world's uh, most outstanding journalist, mm. and said well, if he can't have a blue tick. I thought, well, well, what's what's the point of wearing this laurel yeah. if it, if you can't give it to the best? I don't mm -hmm. aspire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fair enough. But, um, and, you know, what you, we are really seeing <clears throat> is this mirroring um, feature. It's not actually journalism, it's public relations. And um, I would say that, you know, if, if you drew, drew a pie chart mm. and, said, uh, and, and you were able to lump together all of the content which is generated in a single day by... The ABC, radio, television, online, SBS, 7, 9, uh, 10, The Guardian, uh, The Conversation, um, The Australia Institute, um, you know, um, US, uh, NBC, MSNBC, um, Public Radio, um, put it all together. Hmm. I would probably now... You know, the truth is that as we're seeing this generational change, I think it's fair to say that Rupert um, was a more distinctive personality who had a coherent set of values mm. that reflected an individual whose name was Rupert Murdoch. I would say that the next generation of the Murdoch family is a much more generic uh, commodity. And yeah, we, okay. we will just find that um, the paper under, um, you know, that, that the Murdoch Empire under, uh, you know, James Lachlan um, and it is going to just increasingly look like the ABC uh, with ads. Um, in, in Okay, let me let me defend them a little bit, and I, and I will concede from the outset that you know this landscape better than I do. But let me push back a little bit, and because I'd like to hear your response on this. Yeah, the Murdoch Empire, on the whole, and I believe to this day this remains true, but it may not, mm -hmm. has been much more divided in terms of you know how newspapers will endorse a particular candidate in some elections, and and they will they will come out on certain issues. Mm -hmm. The Murdoch media has seemed to me, when compared to Fairfax or the ABC or anything like that. Uh, to be much more diverse in who their the, you know, the political persuasions advocated by their senior editorial team. I know a number of the Murdoch newspapers advocated for um, 
uh, well, Kevin Rudd against John Howard when that 2007 election came along. Mm -hmm. Is that not the case anymore? Do you disagree? Like, or, or is that perhaps not even a valid measure of what you're talking about? Are you talking about something entirely different? Oh, no, 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 no. Absolutely a valid measure. I mean, I regard the capacity to host diverse opinion as the first test um, of, uh, of a, um, uh, you know, uh, of, of a media organisation. Sure. You know, the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, when they when they re retained me uh, to write opinion, uh, and that was one relationship where I didn't actually get sacked uh, mm. and actually quite enjoyed um, my time at the Herald, but the editor described me as a hygiene hire. Right. Um, where I was simply there to demonstrate that the paper had the capability to host... Different I see. So you were the diversity hire, the intellectual yeah. diversity hire. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, <laughs> and in the end, I found, um, you know, I didn't. Uh, I, I, I declined to renew um, writing a fortnightly column, column, uh, just because I found that the uh, column kind of dominated my life in a way that. Um, uh, you know that if I was getting paid. Um, what you know, I suppose a dollar a word or something. Um, mm. but it was consuming 20% of my brain space, and I and I, yeah. I, I couldn't couldn't afford it. But uh, perhaps a mistake, who knows? Um, so I don't want to, uh, they, they, they don't bear any uh, responsibility there. But I do say to you, I mean, the the motto of the Sydney Morning Herald, um, mm. was I think in Latin. But it was, if I can remember it, uh, in moderation, all my glory, the Tory calls me Whig and the Whig, he calls me Tory. Uh, and they were sort of saying, you know, we are the honest broker. Equally yeah, we're, we're in that middle ground. Yeah. Okay. Both sides, you know, yeah. they're both irritated with us. And we do find these figures uh, in modern and uh, ancient history who managed to... Um, irritate all sides yeah um, and <clears throat> yet now we find um an organization like the sydney morning herald part of the nine entertainment group mm. which i would say is just entirely uh incapable of um you know of of more than one opinion i mean the if if you look at the again if we do the pie chart and the say chart, the spectrum yeah. of opinion on climate change mm -hmm. uh, or more but, but that's, because, that's because there is no respectable difference of opinion. Don't, yeah. Haven't you heard that 97% of all the experts agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the infantile quality of this. And but if we say, I then say, well, let's go to the money, you know, let's follow the money. Mm. And what the government has effectively done, uh, when Justin Trudeau was asked, um, you know, about his treatment by the Canadian uh, media, uh, yeah. he he made the right observation um, that we did give them six hundred million dollars, um, and one of the biggest untold stories, and frankly, I would I would regard it as a scandal. Um, yeah. It's one of those stories that you won't see reported, and we mm -hmm. can make a long list of all the stories mm -hmm. we know will not be reported. There there, mm -hmm. there may be a couple of thousand truckers who head down to Canberra to protest about COVID, mm. uh, who are met by a group of so-called police officers bearing machine guns, yeah. who order them when they stand under the balcony to stand in the rain uh, to exercise their rights uh, as citizens. But that story, you just know in your heart, before you pick up the Sydney Morning Herald, you know, the one story that is not going to be there yeah. uh, is that story. And yeah. indeed, um, there is now, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald is really defined by its silence on this vast array of issues. And mm. um, it's, we, you know, but it's run, you know, if I'm going to give, you know, my mate, well, I, I just, I, I want to emphasize that point. Mm. But if you go, if I say to you, Tafer, can you just point me to the investigative journalist who has told us 
how much money the Commonwealth Government uh, Department of Health, the New South Wales Department of Health and the Victorian Department of Health combined, how much money, how many million dollars per month are they spending on advertising in the mainstream media on COVID-related fear? Oh, okay, it's What's insane. Um, I reckon the Commonwealth is actually obligated to report the amount of money. To disclose it. Yeah, uh, that they spent. Now they do, in fact, have an. Um, uh, they have in the legislation or the regulation, there is an exemption from strictly reporting if a matter has to be undertaken under extremely urgent circumstances or there is some other pressing policy reason. Uh, but I say to our audience today, I mean, the idea that uh, you know that, that that the Sydney Morning Herald. I mean, they used to have a guy like. Um, for example, um, who am I thinking of? Well, they had some very senior investigative reporters mm. um, who, Michael West, for example. Right. I don't agree with Michael West on plenty of matters, but sure. I respect him as a absolutely factual investigative journalist. Right. And um, if I'm reading Michael West, I know I'm not reading a, just, a, just a PR puff bull story, yeah. which I'm reading yeah. from 70% of the other so-called uh, journalists. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what has happened is the government has simply bought the editorial. Mm -hmm. So you had this extraordinary situation. If we take, say, the Sky News situation where you've got Alan Jones. Mm hmm who was then also at the Daily Telegraph. Okay. Yeah. Alan Jones had a reach, which I would estimate was five times bigger than the then editor of the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. The editor of the Daily Telegraph sacks Alan Jones on the mm -hmm. basis that you are not resonating with our audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Alan Jones can spit over the editor's uh, audience Whereas the editor has got to put on alpine climbing boots to get to the top of Alan Jones's audience. Yeah. And why you say, well, this is obviously irrational if it's a newspaper trying to build an audience, but it's yeah. not irrational if the Daily Telegraph is holding up a funnel to Greg Hunt and Greg Hunt is pouring cash yeah. into the Daily Telegraph so that you basically 100%. cannot turn a page or click on the screen without a piece of COVID fear porn uh, assaulting and molesting you. Mm -hmm. And so you wind up in a situation where there's just this wave of cash running through 7, 9, 10, uh, Herald, Telegraph, um, whatever. Everywhere you go, the Commonwealth mm -hmm. is opening its purse and spending your money to buy the editorial. And so mm. the papers just say, if Alan Jones comes out and says, well, look, I'm, I'm a bit sceptical about, you know, some of these COVID measures. I'm sorry, mate. Out you go. Yeah, 100%. Doesn't matter how much your audience loves you. Doesn't matter how many people you reach. It doesn't matter if you employ five people to get, to ensure the accuracy of the statements you're making, yeah. unpaid for by the station. But you do it because you never want to make a mistake. Yeah. Uh, that guy gets sacked. Yeah. The, the actual good journalist that has integrity, unfortunately, it has a hard time finding a place in, in the modern uh, media landscape or the modern journalistic yeah. landscape. This is a topic that I, I discussed a little bit with Matt Wong of Discernible. We had a chat. He interviewed me after the launch of the documentary, and um, we were talking about bias. And he, he put to me, you know, are you biased? The question, are you, is your documentary biased? 100% it is. Of course it's biased. There, You will not find a single piece of journalism, even from those journalists that are working incredibly hard to try and put aside their own biases, you will not find an unbiased piece of content anywhere for the simple fact that their decision to even cover the topic is a reflection of certain biases that they hold. As you said before, there are mastheads that will not cover certain things. The choice to cover or not to cover, even if they cover factually, the choice to cover an event is, in fact, an, an act of, of bias in and of itself. If you, if you want to describe, you know, we, we've just undergone over the last two years um, what even Greg Hunt describes as the greatest uh, medical experiment in human history. Mm -hmm. um, 
using a range of drugs which have been developed at what President Trump describes as warp speed. Yeah. Utilising a technology, uh, you know, uh, RNA uh, spike uh, protein injection, which has never been used before. Um, and we are doing it with a level of compulsion, mm -hmm. which is in obvious breach of the uh, Nuremberg Convention on mm -hmm. participation in medical experiments. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you, if we think uh, 7, 9, 10 of the ABC or the Sydney Morning Herald or the Daily Telegraph are going to write a single story approaching uh, investigative journalism on vaccine injury, you know, <laughs> you, you're absolutely, uh, you've got Buckley's chance yeah. reading well, investigative journalism about vaccine injury in any yeah, of yeah. Australia's mainstream media because they're all on the take. Correct. They're in the deal. They're in yeah. on the racket. And we haven't even mentioned the tax rebate that the federal government gave to all the broadcasters. So they pay a fee to use bandwidth in Australia. I believe it's $41 million a year, if my memory serves me correctly. And the government, the federal government handed them back a tax rebate, plus another, I think it was $50 million in relation to, to something. I, I, I'll have to go and look at the details, but there's something in the order of $91 million in tax rebates and direct funding in relation to them pushing out the government's message on the coronavirus and vaccines. And that's that's from a federal level, let alone all the spending. I mean, someone made the comment earlier, and I, I believe it's true based on some, some articles that came out last week, the Victorian government is the biggest advertiser in Victoria. They are the biggest source of revenue for anyone whose who's revenue is advertising. Now, if if you think that that a a um, an owner of a, a newspaper or a, a senior um, editor is going to sit there and allow some young up and coming ambitious journalist to break a big story about vaccine injuries on mm. the front page of a newspaper that is dependent on government advertising to um, to survive. Well, I'm sorry, that story is not going to make it in there. And journalists know that, so they don't even write the story in the first place. That story never gets written because they know it will never see the light of day. So what we what we find, and, and, and we could make the list, um, <clears throat> when we talk about, um, you know, the client uh, media, mm. um, the, um, the inside club, um, those who are uh, risk protected, those who are benefiting benefiting from the flow of let's remember, the government's not spending their own money. This no, is no, no. The, no. This, <laughs> this is the genius of the left model uh. is they get someone else to pay for the campaign. Mm -hmm. And but I, I just say to um you know we, we say uh if the um you know if, if a Chinese news agency wishes to publish a story um on YouTube or um, is reported somewhere in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, they will say, you know, this newspaper is, uh, this news agency is an organ of the uh, Chinese government, okay? Yeah. Now, we don't say that every time we have to look at, you know, an ABC report, uh, even though the ABC is entirely a creature of the government. Yeah. Uh, and we don't carry that warning. The thing that I object to as a matter of, you know, if we're talking about journalistic ethics, where a journalists are allowed to, in effect, write on matters over which, in which their organisation has a commercial interest, mm. but they should disclose it. Mm -hmm. And I just say I have never in the last two years yeah. where I reckon the Commonwealth Government is easily, is, is, in my guess is they're spending a million dollars a day mm. in... It didn't have to be up there. Yeah. Media. I've never seen it. I've never seen a story in uh, the age mm. uh, talking about um, you know vaccine rates that says underneath the age newspaper receives cash sponsorship from the Federal Department of Health of you know uh, of a hundred thousand dollars a day. Yeah. I've never seen it disclosed. Yeah. No. So I say, well. Is is this journalism or you know or, or something else? Well, you know what, yeah. what is it? Yeah, and and this is where you know we look at at the the Soviet the USSR and Pravda and these various government owned mouthpieces is is all that they were in the end. And we look at that and we say, oh, what a bankrupt 
um, culture they must have had within their journalism. What a, what a what a horrible society where the only newspapers you can get a hold of are are basically government mouthpieces. We look at China today with their digital iron curtain around the internet and what people, what their citizens can access, and we look down our noses at that, completely unaware that we've actually got practically the same thing happening here in Australia. It happened via a different mechanism. It happened not through direct control of the content, but through financial control of the companies. And and they didn't they didn't do a communist takeover. This isn't Marxism. This is if I can if I can put an uncomfortable proposition to you, uh, what we're what we've actually seen, in my opinion, and this is only a relatively recent in the last year or so, I've begun to go. Hang on, um, what we've seen, in my opinion, is actually close to Benito Mussolini's definition of fascism which is the, the union of, of state and um, corporations to, towards a common goal, where, where in Marxist philosophy, the government would own the newspapers, would own the, the means of production, etc. cetera. In, in fascist philosophy, at least as it was defined by Benito Mussolini, it's not a well-defined concept. Um, fascism isn't, isn't precisely defined, but as he defined it, it is essentially them being on the same team. Mm. And I, I think... I think I, I can't see a better way to describe what's happened with the media recently yeah. than that they are now on the same team as the government and they will do whatever they need to do in order to remain on the same team and keep receiving that money. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you've, you've, you've got it in, in, in a nutshell. Um, what happened was uh, these guys have flipped hmm. and um, for a long time we all operated on the assumption that the uh, major mastheads were on the side of their readers. Yeah. Um, but the major mastheads got to a point, I think largely as we saw the gradual growth in the size of the state yeah. as a player in the economy, yeah. the state reached a point of dominance whereby mm. a combination of its monopoly control over the right to tax and its monopoly control over the right to regulate these two factors. Um, the the major media said to the government, "Well, look, if you will just build a regulatory moat around our ownership of these licences, yeah, if you will take massive slabs of taxpayer funds raised from the concierge at the hotel and the Uber driver and the independent contractor and." Mm -hmm. You know the small business, the baker, uh, and the candlestick maker. <laughs> we'll take the money from them, and and you can you can take it, and you yeah. give that to us, and yeah. promote around our licenses, and we will reflect back to you whatever your latest daft, you know, mm -hmm. uh, build back better policy. Um, you know, um, boys can be girls, uh, etc. Uh, name it, change whatever daft shit you want. We'll give it back to you in high resolution. Yeah. They actually don't give us stuff about their audience. Yeah. And 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 you see the most extreme version of it at the ABC, you know, where you can turn on ABC Breakfast Radio and if, if you can last 25 seconds, you know, you've got 25 seconds spare more than I do. You know, <laughs> listen to it. You just got this bromide tone of a yeah. sort of a, a sort of unctuous moral superiority to the unwashed redneck masses, and the audience gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, but but you know we we used to go head to head against the ABC at, on outsiders on a Sunday morning. We had insiders versus outsiders. Yeah. We were running with four ad breaks an hour. They were yep. running with ad breaks. We were smashing them in the ratings week on week by yeah. about. 25 to 30 to 50 percent bigger audience on Sky News, yeah, for a show that had to advertise to pay its bills from what the ABC was getting. But the truth, because the ABC would get four people who agreed about absolutely everything, mm -hmm. uh, and sit around as Jared Henderson says, and all agree with each other furiously, yeah, uh, and do that for an hour, and we would smash them in the radio, but they never cared because, yeah, they didn't have an owner beyond the minister, and they were there with their mirror, uh, you know, pushing back to. Not so much the liberal, um, you know, the liberal view or indeed even the Labor view. Right. But what the mainstream media is reflecting back is the state 
view. Yeah. So this permanent contest between the freedoms of the citizen and the powers of the state. And what the mainstream media will always say is that the culprit is the citizen and the solution is the state. Yeah. And that's the trial which is taking place every day. And so you yeah. will always find the greedy boss. You will never find the greedy public servant. You yeah. will always find the nasty <laughs> complicated. You will never <laughs> find the vast pyramid of waste which is taking place. You know? Um, <sighs> That's the real, that's the status bias of the mainstream media to their biggest client. Yeah. And that's that's the reality of the relationship. The government is a client. As you pointed out, they are spending our money, vast sums of it, far more than most corporations can afford, uh, yeah. in order to basically sell us on the idea that the government is a good thing. If, if, if this is not a... a, a and again, I hesitate to use the word because it's it's such a big word. But if this is not a fascist combining of the power of state and corporation together, mm. then I'm not quite sure what is. Yeah. I mean, it's it is a takeover of the functions of the corporate world, even if not the ownership of the corporate world. It's it's insane that we find ourselves in this position. Now, Ross, I, I want to pick your brain a little bit, um, specifically on China and on um, Russia. Because I think we're going to find probably a few points of disagreement along the way, which is always fun. Um, but also because I think these are very relevant and very real issues for our time. Yeah. China and activities in the South China Sea, etc., are a source of anxiety for many in the West and many Australians. Russia and what's happening in Ukraine is a source of anxiety for, for many in the West. Let's talk about it. Should should we be worried? What What is your view then uh, on Xi Jinping? You described him as the second most rational actor after Vladimir Putin. Yeah. What do you think his intentions are? What do, what do you think our approach to, to China should be? Well, um, I would say 180 degrees opposite to the current approach. Okay. Um, yeah. um, for, for, for the sake of clarity and walking our way into this slowly, how would you describe our current approach? Well, our current approach is Australia wants to be at the absolute head of the queue. Having started out... Uh, by, you know, I can't remember if it was 60 Minutes or A Current Affair, but they certainly reached 20 million people with a story saying that COVID began in a Chinese wet market mm -hmm. uh, because the Chinese eat bats. Uh, and they were so determined to make graphic visualisations of this um, apparent fact. Mm -hmm. uh, they flew a team who couldn't get into China, so they threw them to a Indonesian wet market. And they thought, mm -hmm. well, just as good. They've all got yeah, no one. Will, no one will be able to spot the difference. <laughs> um, and uh, they ran this big story: Chinese eat bats, and as a result, this is now this is Australia's approach to uh, diplomacy with China, uh, and it has the same factual veracity as uh, uh, ninety-five percent of the rest of the content we have received on COVID from the mainstream masthead media, which is a complete uh, bunch of crap. Um, sure. But so we say, first of all, we want to smear the Chinese uh, as bat eaters. Then from there, we wish to say um, when no one has the first clue, you know, where the virus actually came from. We say Australia is the one who must move the motion at the United Nations out of yeah. 192 sovereign states. The country whose economy is the most heavily exposed to China with the exception yeah. of North Korea, probably, we appoint ourselves to be the provokers in chief, you know, to stand at the front of the queue, puffing out our chests, saying, you Chinese are responsible uh, for this virus. Yeah. And we want to blame you for it. Now, I say to you, um, the question of where a virus comes from was actually discussed in the ancient world uh, quite right. extensively. Um, first of all, um, most beautifully uh, by Lucretius in the poem De Rerum Natura, one of the most influential poems of the ancient world, uh, which encapsulated the uh, Epicurean philosophy, which I suspect uh, Taifa, you would be a subscriber to. 
if I had to say, you know, what is Topher? I think he's he's fairly Epicurean uh, in outlook. Broadly speaking, however, I, I don't profess to be profoundly um, informed as to exactly what that would what that would mean. But from my limited exposure, yes, they were the enjoyers of life. Mm. The Stoics mm. were the believers in duty, in discipline, in honour, in yes. uh, courage. The Epicureans were the believers in pleasure, uh, in freedom, in live and let live. Um, yes. But they did, to be fair. There is a place for duty and there is certainly a place for, for stoicism. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out why my microphone is not behaving here. Um, but, but broadly speaking, um, the, the, the pursuit of happiness, as the American yeah. framers of, of their constitution uh, called it, I think is yeah. a, a fundamental human drive and one that should be given place. Yeah. Um, but the point is, uh, in De Rerum Natura, um, Lucretius, who was a genius, he said, look, he was talking about the plague of Athens, which took place in about uh, 430 BC. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened at, during, the, during the Peloponnesian War when Sparta was actually um, attacking Athens and mm -hmm. the Athenians had built a wall around the city. And um, as the Spartans attacked, the Athenians moved back inside the wall uh, and the plague broke out inside the yeah. world. Mm. And um, De Rerum Natura uh, opens with a sort of a poem of praise to the goddess of love and procreation, Venus. Mm. But it finishes with one of the most graphic um, articulations of the plague uh, mm. um, to literature, ancient or modern. <clears throat> and talks about a real pandemic. Uh, not, not, not this sort of pretend uh, pandemic mm -hmm. we've been going on. And in the real pandemic, of course, the Athenians were all stuck inside the wall. And yeah. They, historians differ about how many died, uh, but certainly, um, you know, quite possibly a hundred thousand uh, people. Um, Which within the walls of a single city, you, you're going to notice that. It's a shitload. And, and so then um, Lucretia starts talking about the breakdown, not just of the sort of epidemiological symptoms of, of the plague, which he described mm. quite graphically, which we think are mm. small locks, but he also describes the breakdown in the social relationships as mm. a consequence, which is really what, what we are also experiencing ourselves. And so sure. I feel very familiar. And he says that at the very lowest point of this description, he says that because the Athenians were very proud of the fact that of their burial uh, rites, right. and they uh, cremated their dead. And so, but what happened was as all of the people were dying, they ran out of firewood inside mm. the walls. Mm. And they, uh, there were these very graphic, very heartbreaking scenes, for example, where Lucretia describes a, 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 a toddler inside a small home mm. and looking in and seeing the toddler crawling over the dead body of its young mother and father. Mm. But nobody, and, and then people wondering, am I going to go in and rescue the toddler? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think we've seen this creation of the other, you know, mm. both the, uh, in particular, the unvaxxed is now, you know, the toddler sure. in, the, yeah. in the mind of Mark McGowan and Daniel Andrews and mm. uh, a, a bunch of other arseholes uh, who have sought to stigmatise a group of Australians for um, exercising a very sen sensible, you know, medical conscience-based uh, opinion. Mm. Um, but the point is that Lucretia says when, when they ran out of wood, um, they, you would have a situation where they were then burning multiple bodies on the same pyre. Yeah. So they had to have enough to bury, you know, where a whole family would get wiped out and they'd all yeah. be... Uh, and then what would happen is the family would go around and collect the wood by sort of pulling the stays out of the ceiling and... And, and out of the doors or wherever mm -hmm. they find the wood to bury the bodies. And they would assemble the pyre and then some other passing family would come along and dump their dead on it and set fire mm -hmm. to it, right? Mm -hmm. 
and you would have these uh, riots taking place around the funeral pyres, uh, which included, at the lowest of the low, um, throwing on the still living bodies uh, of the infected uh, who were yeah. expected to die. So that's how bad it can get. How bad it can get. Mm. You have documented quite beautifully how bad it has gotten so far. So far, uh, yes. Lucretia's that's a frightening. That's a frightening two words there. But yes, so far. But the point going back from this elliptical journey to where <laughs> with China, Lucretia says, "Look, um, you know the, the the virus which he called the tainted air, and he uh, was a fan of Democritus, who was mm. in effect the closest thing to an atheist in the ancient world, mm. uh, who talks about the atom and the void." He says there are only two things. Democritus says there's only two things, the atom and the void. He's not a believer in God. And, mm. and Lucretius is in that tradition, that Epicurean materialist tradition. Right. And he says, look, we may either walk into the tainted air or the tainted air may get blown into us, but we breathe it in through our mouth and nose we don't have a filter which is able to distinguish between air which is tainted mm -hmm. and air which is not. Mm -hmm. We just breathe it in and yep. we breathe it out. And he says it is a very grave error to look around, see, even though there's a very strong impulse to find someone to blame, um, it's a very grave error to do so because he says that just as you look around the earth and you see human beings are very different in the way we look and appear to each other, mm -hmm. uh, which I was an observation I made the mistake of making on one occasion. <laughs> that, uh, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't one of the times you got fired, was it? Well, it could have been. But it I, could I, have I, been, I, maybe, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, but Lucretius uh, in... Lucretius was actually quite uh, relatively late. He's about, I think we find Durerum Natura is probably about 50 BC, something like that, but it could be earlier, might be earlier. Um, he says, don't waste your energy looking for someone to blame for an epidemic. Mm. Okay, These things happen. According to the Bible, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse, sure. which are war, uh, famine, uh, pestilence and wild beasts. Mm. Um, and according to the Bible, you know, they've been given dominion over 25% of the earth's population. Um, there are forces which are bigger than us. Now, yeah. in this case, if we want to blame anyone for the COVID virus, you know, we've got uh, our mate um, Fauci spending American tax dollars on gain-of-function research on bats in a lab in Wuhan. Yeah. Okay, and, now... And, and then swearing black and blue that he wasn't. Yeah. Now, so, so I just say to you, I don't even object. If somebody had come to me and said, Ross, do you want to study zootropic viruses in a um, lab in China, would, would Australia support the research? Uh, if you'd come to me five years ago and I was the Minister for Health or Foreign Affairs, somebody put the proposition to me and said, you want to do a joint study? The truth is we know nothing, hardly anything uh, about the whole world of the virus. We should know a lot more about it. Indeed, most of the maps of the so-called tree of life mm -hmm. that uh, have been produced over the last 100 years we see line branches in the tree which go out to the Ikea, uh, which are microscopic and virtually indistinguishable to you and me from bacteria. Sure, they sure. have the same sort of function and lifestyle uh, uh, as each other, but they are just morphologically structured in a different way. Hmm. So we have the, uh, the Ikea and the bacteria who are massive branches in the tree of life. Sure. So then we have the animalia you know which is uh you know Animals. which yeah. is you, you and me um and then we usually had this kind of dotted line out to the viruses 
because we could see they were massive, they were mm. ancient, they were absolutely prolific, um, but we weren't quite sure they were living uh, in the sense in which the other branches in the tree of life were. Yeah, and, and the, 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 the distinction there, as I understand it, being viruses uh, require a host. They, they're not a stepping stone towards life in any kind of evolutionary model. Uh, yeah. And I think existing evolutionary models have incredible flaws in them. But even putting that aside, you, you cannot say that a nice and simple organism like a virus is a stepping stone towards a single-celled organism because yeah. actually the virus cannot survive without that single-celled organism already being in existence. Correct. So it's not really the virus is, is, is it and it, it, can it really be described as a single-cell organism when it's existing outside a host? Yeah. And it's, it's just a completely different strategy um, to exist in, you know, the tens and hundreds of billions as a, uh, as a kind of a half, mm. as an integer, which, you know, 99.99999% of viral particles will never actually enter a host. Yeah. But they don't yeah. need to because they only need, there's so many of them. Yeah, that's right. And they can replicate so quickly when they do get to a host. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah, putting that, yeah. let's come back to China, drill down to China. I just say to you, um, we don't, I don't, I think we still don't really know. Uh, okay. we're, we, we each can have a theory where there's a certain amount of data around, um, like the inquiry into MH17 or, you know, MH370, um, 370, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the data is all uh, intensely politicised. Um, and sure. the idea that Australia should rush around being the leader of the world community, wanting to accuse China and hold China responsible and make China pay, blah, blah, blah. I just think from a foreign policy standpoint, when the single biggest provider of um, students to Australia's tertiary sector is China, the single biggest mm -hmm. provider of tourists to Australia's tourism sector is China, the single mm -hmm. biggest buyer of Australia's largest export product, uh, iron ore, is China, the single mm -hmm. biggest buyer of Australia's second largest export, uh, high, high quality coke and coal, is China. And mm -hmm. so if you think your best idea as the whole foreign policy establishment of this country and the intelligence agency, your best idea is to go and find your best customer and insult him every day, I think yeah. you've got shit for brains. I think that's what right. you've I want to put a pin in that because we haven't discussed Xi Jinping at all. That's that, that the viral the virus origin side of things is is kind of a sideline. Um and, and I want to I want to discuss Xi Jinping, uh the Communist okay, Party well, and, and such. But, but hang on, before we do, before we do, I just want to draw everyone's attention to James Bennett's incredible tale of woe here. Um, he says the Athens plague sounds terrible. I mean, a hundred thousand dead in one city, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, but wait till you hear what happened to James. But when I had COVID and I was isolating, the Coles website was down. So I had to get my groceries from Woolies. So this pandemic is also bad, as he points out. Uh, James, James, my heart goes out to you. That that level of suffering in a free country, that should never happen. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Mm. Um, okay, let, let's let's get into the meat, the, the meat of... Most people's concerns around China transcend the virus, the virus origins, any of that. In the Western world, whether it's a media beat up, whether it's true or not, I will allow you to, to elucidate yeah. your views on that. Yes. <clears throat> but the concern is around the belief that Xi Jinping has imperial expansionist ambitions for China yeah. to try and reclaim what they view as some of their lost territories and that they may very well be willing to go <clears throat> to go to war to achieve that. What's your you view know, on that? Um, <clears throat> I find this one of the areas where if we follow the facts wherever they may lead us. <coughs> I just find this uh, this argument for me is as easy as climate change. Um, it's a no-brainer. It's a slam dunk for me. Okay. For me. Okay. All right. Um, um, I mentioned Julian Assange has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Sure. I believe that if we strip away our prejudices and our interests and our tribal associations. And if you could remove the word, um, take away the word China, well, more especially the words Chinese Communist Party. Right. Uh, I'm going to irritate a few people. Please but do. It's, it's my favourite thing. The performance of the Chinese Communist Party since Deng Xiaoping in 1980, mm -hmm. 
the reformer. Yep. Who said my objective is to um, eradicate um, poverty in China. In I think he said, you know, I forget what his UN development goal was, but I remember when he announced it. I remember listening to it about what his objectives were in terms of the speed at which they intended to reduce poverty in China, mm -hmm. or at least reduce the numbers of those living under uh, what the UN uh, described as the poverty line. Sure. Uh, there is no organisation in human history who has lifted more people out of poverty than the Chinese Communist Party. Not one. Not one, Taifa. There's not. There's the Chinese Communist Party who has lifted over a billion people out of destitution and poverty into a middle-class lifestyle in four decades, and then there is daylight to okay. the second place. Daylight. Excellent. Let's now, have an argument. Give me, give me the superior performer in the reduction of human poverty and destitution who exceeds the Chinese Communist Party since Deng Xiaoping. Excellent. Challenge accepted. The Chinese Communist Party has lifted people out of poverty only in proportion to how far it has deviated from communist orthodoxy. They lifted Fine. people out. Mate, they lifted that argument is as weak as piss. What you're saying is they're capitalists. I say we should celebrate that. I, 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 actually, I, actually think, I actually think they're more like fascists. I, I think if you want to see a merger between state and, and corporations, I think China is your go-to model on that right now. Um, the, I would say the, Victoria, but, you know, uh, Western um, Australia, but keep going. Well, no, I mean, in China, you see, as soon as a company gets to a certain size, the, the, the Chinese government comes in and takes a controlling share of, of the company. You can't become wealthy in China. I mean, as much as it produced an enormous number of, of billionaires, you can't become wealthy in China unless you are in bed with the government. We right. see the way they treat billionaires who okay, speak well, out. I say to you, you can't become wealthy in Australia unless you're in bed with the government. Um, the the level that w what I will at least say to you is that the quality of the distinction <clears throat> now so blurred they're now so close you've got a choice between an incompetent socialist mm -hmm. in Scott Morrison or Gladys Berejiklian or Daniel Andrews and a competent socialist uh, in <laughs> Xi Jinping they're the options I that we are being offered. And I'm, I'm I'm certainly not going to die on the hill of defending any right, Australian government on or, a humanitarian or basis. If we are honest, okay, you know there is no one in history. Most of human history uh, is you know is brutal and short. Human life yeah. is brutal and short. Yeah. Uh, most people have lived exposed to the elements, mm -hmm. dying of cold, mm -hmm. dying of hunger. Um, you know. Of um, and you know, for a million years, uh, with exposure to a whole range of other wild beasts, uh, over which you know, we thank the Australian Aboriginal for wiping out and making extinct the megafauna, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, who were otherwise uh, would have otherwise wiped us out. Yeah, but I just say to you, the firstly, if you want to talk about the humanitarian argument, I have mm -hmm. to admit in secret, quietly, just between you and me, you know, and, I sort of have to admit the fact, what have the Romans ever done for us? What have the CCP ever done for the Chinese people? Well, they've lifted a fucking billion of them out of poverty. That's what okay. they've done. Okay, so then how do you explain the fact that hundreds of millions of people in the African continent are emerging from poverty right now, that the same thing is happening in India, that the, this has been a global phenomenon and it has been more closely tied with global trade and access to free markets than it has been to the Chinese Communist Party's governance? Uh, uh, okay, mate. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, Mike Tyson uh, walking into a, a drunk and debilitated dementia suffering, uh, you know, George Foreman at the moment. Okay. Uh, these arguments are... Listen, Ross, don't hold back. Tell me what you really yeah. think. I can feel you're holding um, back at the moment. Just brother, tell me what you really think. Uh, okay. Um, can I tell you, uh, you've got China and India side by side. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's call it, you know, East Asia, Central Asia, side by side, two continents. Yep. Yep. I've got a lot of affection for India for a whole range of reasons. Uh, but if you want to get something done, even if you want to talk about levels of corruption, oh, sure. you know, I, I say there's corruption 
everywhere, including in our own hearts. Yes. None of us are. I, I haven't met anyone who's completely immune to it. I've met some pretty well, look, safely. Look, people. Speak, for I'm not, speak for yourself, Ross. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm the only perfect person I know. It's very yeah. lonely. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure it is. It must be heartbreaking. I'm saying to you, mate, the Chinese story uh, it, is, it is incredible. It is qualitatively and, different. And Deng Xiaoping Very deserves cool. a huge but amount China of China has got, what, 35,000 kilometres of high-speed rail? Something like that. I, yeah, I, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Uh, the United States has got, you know, 50 kilometres or something. You know, sure, the but- governor of California decided he wanted to build a high-speed railway between two of the most you know, richest cities in the world, Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. Uh, he started out saying it was going to cost um, $30 billion. Uh, By the time they got to the end of the project, they realised it was going to cost $80 billion, uh, and they abandoned the project. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, um, no I, I, one I, in history. So China has got this, you know, the average Shanghai 15-year-old mm. is 30 months ahead of the average Melbourne fifteen-year-old in reading, writing, and problem solving, thirty Again, months. I'm not. Go- I'm not going to defend our education okay. system. You, okay. You're preaching to the choir. So, so their engineering wipes the floor with us. Their education system Ooh, is a whole okay. massive well, well, step pause, up from pause. us. They're, 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 they've just landed. They, they're one of three countries in the world who can put astronauts into space using their own technology. Uh, they've lifted well over a billion people out of from destitution into an asset-owning, middle-class, aspirational in four decades. It has never been done in human history. No one I, even approaches it. Alexander the Great was a massive, massive reformer. But compared to, you know, uh, to, to Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, no one has even attempted it. Uh, no one has gotten close. So I just say, all right, that's the humanitarian argument. I, okay. I have to admit uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, wins that argument on the numbers. Then you want to go to the South China Sea. But I, I don't think it's a causal relationship. I don't oh, think that darling. the Chinese Communist Party Please. was the cause of that. Obviously. It was causal. That wasn't communism that did it, but it was what they call socialism with Chinese characteristics. And we can have an argument about how much of it is socialism and how much of it is Chinese characteristics, but I'm saying to you, I've got senior Australian CEOs running multi-hundred million dollar corporations looking over there and saying to me today, China mm. has the superior model in terms of the role between centralization uh, and citizen rights and the ability to mobilize a population and to allocate capital. They are saying to me, in secret, China has the superior model. I'm not. I, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying to you is, I'm not going to put myself at the front of the queue and poke China in the eye and criticise China. Do we have a bilateral security relationship with China? No. Uh, where we used to meet together to talk about human rights, okay? Yeah. We're a yeah. bunch of muesli chomping, sandal-wearing, latte-sipping wankers. Wait, uh, leave off yeah. with the lattes, mate. Yeah. Just just, yeah. just drop the lattes, all right? Um, uh, <laughs> I, if I was Xi Jinping, I, I would say to um, Australia, okay, I want to hold the next bilateral dialogue in... Mm. Um, uh, Carnarvon uh, or Kintor or, um, you know, Falls Creek. Sure. Uh, or um, I want to find the biggest village 200 kilometres away from Alice Springs and I want to hold the bilateral uh, human rights uh, meeting on the Thursday night on which um, the pensions are paid. And I think we should start the meeting at about 9 30 p.m. Sure. And there uh, you will watch, uh, instead of the Athenian situation where they're crawling over the dead bodies of the parents, they'll be crawling over the comatose bodies of the parents. And sure. we will give China a lecture uh, about human rights and the Uyghurs. 
you take the Uyghurs, God bless the Uyghurs. Okay, well, the Uyghurs for, from 2000 to 2016 were on the uh, UN's list of terror-based uh, organisations. Sure. Because we know, uh, thanks to WikiLeaks, surprise, surprise, uh, mm. who is actually the organisation that gives us actual news rather than the uh, homogenised, pasteurised, hermetically sealed, intelligence agency approved, cut and paste, mm -hmm. uh, doggerel, uh, which passes for foreign policy. You know, the mm. Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, hasn't had a strategic idea in 20 years, but perfectly <laughs> knows how to cut and paste uh, from the Five Eyes, uh, you know, uh, latest uh, bull story. Now... What I'm saying to you is we take the South China Sea. Yeah. You want to say to me, Russia's got aggressive imperialist aspirations in the South China Sea. I say, mate, it's the South China Sea. Sure. But We've it is got also aspirations in the Ukraine. Okay. We want to send what 15,000 American troops into the Ukraine. Oh. If you have a map of the earth, you basically have to go all the way around yeah. to the other side yeah. to get there. Yeah. If, the Chinese if, have got 1.3 billion people. Do you if, know that if you cut off the shipping lanes in the South China Sea for 30 days, several hundred million people would begin to get hungry? Yes. Several hundred million. Yes. Now, I'm saying to you, brother, the Chinese Communist Party understands one thing. They have been through the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. It was a massive fuck-up. Mm -hmm. They're quite determined not to do it, not to repeat it. And one of the ways, one of the things they want to ensure is that the Chinese people are never hungry because they can't get access to food. Sure. And if you've got an economy which gets 25, more than 25% of its protein uh, through the Pearl River Delta in the South China Sea, hmm. uh, I don't think you are going to compromise very readily on your right to access the sea lanes. But 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 it's I don't right think anyone in the neighborhood, not in Ukraine, think... not in Syria. But uh, is anyone questioning in the South China Sea? I don't think anyone is questioning China's right to ship through the South China Sea. Let's keep in mind Vietnam. <laughs> The Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, these also depend on those same waters and they they are concerned about tell the actions this, of China. Tell me this, Taper. How many ships has China stopped in the South China Sea in the last decade? Okay, thus far to my knowledge, none. Okay, zero, brother. Zero. Yep. A big, fat zero. How many times in the 70 years since uh, Taiwan announced its independence... How many bombs has China dropped on Taiwan? Okay, let me ask a different question. How many times have they sent their warplanes to within uh, the, the Taiwanese exclusive airspace, which is universally recognised you have a certain amount of distance from your borders okay. over water? You can. The two sides have got megaphones on either sides of the Taiwan Strait where, depending on which direction the wind is blowing, they can shout at each other from either side. Okay, how are you going to fly a plane through there sure. and say, you're in my space? No, but there's a difference. There's a difference between sending out planes to fly through someone else's airspace versus planes happening to traverse through it. Mate, they're, I'm going to tell you this. China has had 70 years to invade Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, they have not done so. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the only people talking about invading Taiwan uh, are the United States, Australia, United Kingdom, and NATO. I, and I disagree. The Berlin Wall collapsed, okay, we found ourselves with this problem that we had built up the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, this massive bureaucracy which has built the Taj Mahal in mm -hmm. Brussels or whatever its headquarters are, and every day this thing which rivals the ancient pyramids of Giza as a natural wonder... Um, and it all day, it just has Mercedes, late model Mercedes Benz and Audis and BMWs going sure. backwards and forwards with guys getting in and out of the car park covered in medals and carrying massive big fat checkbooks to say, mm. 
we need to buy some more, um, you know, some. we need to buy some more bullets and some more high-speed missiles from Raytheon and bloody uh, Talos Underwater Systems and, um, you know, every other. But we've got to maintain the military-industrial complex. Now, NATO mm -hmm. is a bureaucracy without a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is a vestige like your appendix, uh, which once had a purpose, but today nobody knows what it is. Yeah. And so you've got all the BMWs and the Audis are still moving in and out of the car park, right? <laughs> all the birds are still there sitting on the branch with their mouths open saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. Yeah. yeah. What they desperately must come up with is a reason to spend more money on weapons. Now, the Granted. Chinese, I'm going to say to you, how many bombs have the Chinese dropped on Syria? Sure. I, I you, Again, you're not going to find me defending US imperialism. You're not going to find me defending US NATO. In Iraq, has China dropped in Iraq and sure. Iran? Sure. And you're going to say to me, China is the aggressor? I'm sorry, brother. Okay. It's This is confession time. I wish I was wrong. I really do. I wish I could say those Chinese are mean, nasty, aggressive, blah, blah, blah. Look, I don't love... If, if I sit down with the Chinese Communist Party, as I've done on one or two occasions, okay, sure. with senior figures uh, in the Chinese Communist Party, because I've been trying to do other things up there sure. before Scott Morrison destroyed the relationship uh, in a bilateral agreement to completely destroy a multiplicity of Australian industries, which were intensely reliant because we trusted from the time of Paul Keating, from the time of Gough Whitlam, Paul Keating, mm. John Howard, all of them lined up one after the other and, and preached enmeshment of the Australian economy with the Chinese economy. Sure. So no to a, the most beautiful trading relationship you know, um, since since the since since the Mediterranean in the ancient world under the Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, this beautiful alliance between Australia hitching its wagon to the rise of the Chinese middle class. Mm. We said we're going to give you, we're going to give you our our high quality coke and coal, and we're going to give you our iron ore, and we're going to mm. give you some precious metals. And you're going to give us tourists and you're going to invest in all of our capital star businesses because no Australian uh, funds are willing to back Australian uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, Which I know and, from personal experience, yes. Yeah. Um, and so we trusted the political leadership who said for four decades um, we need to enmesh our economy with China. And then in 2016 we woke up one day and Darth Maurice Payne, a uh, token quoted chick, um, you know, wanders out after sitting with a group of American admirals and says, oh, China is our enemy. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, mate. If it took you 40 years of enmeshment to wake up one morning and say, oh, we've made a mistake, you are a very slow learner. All right. Look, I, I what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, uh, I'm just loading up a video here. It's just going to come on in a second and then I'm going to stop it. Here we go. Um, all right, it's some some good points in there. Some food for thought for me. Um, some things where I'm I I remain in in disagreement. But I think that this okay, point from AAPI. Best one. Your best one. What's so, your best factual disagreement? No, well, my, my so so let me let me lay a few a few um, foundations here before I before I make the disagreement. Number one, I'm all in favour of trade. I, you know, I can't remember who it was that first said it, but, you know, when goods stop crossing borders, troops soon start. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of trade. I'm a big fan of being in a trading relationship with the Chinese. I've got no issue with that whatsoever. Uh, the idea that the Chinese Communist Party ought to be credited with pulling a billion people out of poverty, uh, I, I, I think is incorrect. I think the comparison to India um, is correct if you accept that India is about 20 years behind. The comparison to Africa, Africa is about 30 years behind. We are about to see just as many people pulled out of poverty in just a short amount of time, if not even shorter, because of you know now who's Africa out of access to, to global global you know, um, markets. Really just one, one second, Ross, one okay. second. Um, you know, we, we are about to see the same miracle take place outside of the Chinese Communist Party. We're about to, we're, we're, we're watching it, not about to, we're watching it happen in, in India. We're watching it happen. It's unfolding right now in Africa. 
we, we are seeing that happen outside of the reach of the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I think giving them credit for that, in my opinion, is, is uh, misdirected credit. Um, however, I actually agree with almost everything else that you've said. I, I'm completely opposed to Western imperialism. I'm completely opposed to the US being involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, that's a change for me. At the time, I was that good little conservative, you know, Johnny Howard worshipping person at the time, sure. right? I was, I was all for it. Right, and and I I compl I recognise that I was wrong, and and I'm no longer in favour of that. I'm not in favour of us getting enmeshed in Ukraine. I'm not in favour of any of that. Um, but I do think it's incorrect. As much as um, um, Deng, Xiao, Deng Xiaoping, I always I always lose his name uh, as a reformer was the best thing that happened to China, in my opinion. Um, following Mao Zedong and, and the reforms that he instituted. And I, I discussed that in detail with Dr. Um, Paul Monk. So if you're interested in that, if you're watching, you're interested in that, go back to the slow chat from last year with Dr. Paul Monk. I think it's incorrect to credit the CCP with the the uh, prosperity of their people. They, they literally have achieved that in spite of their own philosophies rather than because of them. But evidently you, you and I have very different views on that. I think you're um, being um, a bit um, mean-spirited, a bit churlish. Okay. Um, I, I wish I could attribute to other factors. You see, I also attribute, I attribute the Cultural Revolution as a disaster. Uh, sure, to, it was. To Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. But I have to, in the same way, attribute the more recent uh, prosperity um, to um, the succession of, um, from, you know, um, from uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Jiang Zemin, um, Xi Jinping. Um, mm. If you want to go and listen, you say you're a John Howard fan. I was, I, was, I, to be very was. clear, was. <clears throat> I dare you on a slow chat, mm -hmm. to go and listen to John Howard's speech to Jiang Zemin okay. in the Joint House of Representatives. In fact, I'm bloody well tempted to play it for you right now. <laughs> Look, um, if, if you've got it as a... As a... Simon Crane, I'm pretty sure it was Simon Crane when Jiang Zemin came to Australia. This was when Australia was still in its rational phase and this was when australia was operating at a position of strength rather than a position of weakness right and the speeches that simon crane and john howard made to jang si men in the house of representatives um is the closest thing to a political love letter um, <laughs> you will ever read right and it is two blokes who and fascinating it was it wasn't the Australians who had said, wasn't John Howard had said, I must go to the People's Assembly to give a speech to the Chinese leadership. Mm. Jiang Zemin said, Invited. yeah. He said, I want to come to Australia. Yeah. And Australia was, I think, I could be wrong, but I think Australia was the single first destination that Jiang Zemin yeah, right. made. Uh, as as president to a foreign country. Yeah, right. He arrived and he said, look, we have two different systems, okay? You want to have a multi-party liberal democracy. We want to have socialism with Chinese characteristics. And he says, we're not going to lecture you about how you run your government. We hope you won't lecture us about he runs how we run ours, but let's hope that rationally and pragmatically, since Gough Whitlam was one of the first, Australia was one of the first countries in the world to say, okay, we're going to recognise this reality, mm -hmm. to take a Kissinger-style brutal realism, say this is mm -hmm. the way the world is going to be. Let's not let's not be wishing and a praying and a hoping it's something different from reality. This is what it is. Yeah, yeah. reality uh, is. We're on board. And Jiang Zemin came back and said, look, we've built this really beautiful relationship. Let's keep going. Yeah. And these boneheads, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you just a little bit, you know, if you want to talk about the so-called intelligence community, <laughs> uh, these are the guys who want to lock up Julian Assange. Mm. Um, these guys were embarrassed 
you know, Mike Pompeo, I'm allegedly, I'm, I'm, you know, I was probably Australia's most out and proud Trump backer mm. on the record uh, in, you know, January 2016 that Donald Trump was going to win. Yeah. Uh, Rowan Dean, you know, because he can't help himself, um, <laughs> uh, reckons he was on the record before me. Um, I'm just having a look for Rowan's new book. Here we go. We'll give him a little plug. There you Rowan. go, the Cranberry, the Canberry Tales. Canberry Rowan Tales. Dean. Yep. Uh, it's not a new book. It's just a rehash of his former um, articles. But his articles what, are pretty good. Okay, his why articles. do they do that? Andrew Bolt does the same thing. I got so annoyed. I bought Andrew Bolt's first book, and it was just a rehash yeah. of his articles, and I was so yeah. pissed off. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but the, um, the, the point is that um, you, when you read The Australian, and with respect to your mate, Monk, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not buying it. Okay. Uh, I've listened to it. Uh, I've studied it. Uh, and I'm not buying it. And what you need to understand is that now we go back to the meta story. Sure. And so let us say for the sake of the argument that there are, um, let's flatter ourselves. So there's half a dozen intelligence services watching Topher Fields slow chat. I know for a fact that there's at least two. I <laughs> know, oh, no, no, I'm serious. I know for a fact that there's at least um, two. And, you know, the reason is we should be flattered. The reason is because Topher moves the dial. A lot of people don't move the dial. Yeah. You, you don't have to have the intelligence service watching, um, you know, what's the name, um, you know, uh, Jenna Price. I mean, we know. Okay, we 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 know what the ABC is going to say before they open their mouth. Okay, yeah, and the yeah. intelligence agencies do as well because they're the ones writing the scripts. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, we know that uh, Hillary Clinton's chief of staff was reading the front page of the Australian Financial Review on uh, shutdown of Dani uh, the night before the paper was being printed. Okay. Yeah because the Sunrise Coalition, funded by the US Democrats and supported by, um, you know, I can't even remember the guy, the daft apparatchik, uh, you know, who ran Hillary's campaign, it'll come to me. But um, my point is, there's some geometry, okay, that you need and your audience uh, mm -hmm. needs to understand, okay? When you talk about, of the various, uh, of the real estate, in the um, mainstream media, um, the most contested, one of the most contested bits of space is the foreign affairs uh, page. Sure. So you can go through the age, so let's call it the formerly broadsheet media, the age, the sure. morning herald, the Australian, um, Australian Financial Review. Yeah, uh, you'll have a couple of other more specialist journalists, Center for Independent Studies, the US Studies Center, the greatest waste of money, you know, classic John Howard, uh, you know, turned out to be just a subsidy 30 professional academics studying the United States at the US Studies Center, Sydney University, 30 out of 30 chose said uh, Hillary Clinton is going to win this election, 30 out of 30. Mm -hmm. yeah. One, uh, Tom Switzer was, um, you know, ambivalent. Yeah. Um, what that tells you is there is no intelligence at the US Study Centre, okay? There is a herd. There is yeah. a flock who are mooing yeah. in unison. <clears throat> and what we see is there is something which we might call the Australian Foreign Policy Establishment. It's actually a relatively small group of people. Sure. Uh, you've got something who are all going to the same conferences, uh, flying on the same flights, usually business class, uh, staying in the same hotels, being sponsored by the same organisations, Boeing, uh, Raytheon. Um, sure. The military also. industrial complex. Yeah. And they're a bunch of mates. Okay. And I've got a lot of respect for them because I respect a good racket when I see one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a little bit like the Chinese Communist Party, you know, it's yeah, a good yeah. racket, but yeah. at least they they deliver something. You know, sure. if, if you want to give me a pure system which delivers nothing and a racket which delivers something, I'll take the racket. 
Uh, and the military industrial complex and the Australian foreign policy establishment is a racket. What they aim to do, I'm going to tell you, uh, look, I've known Maurice Payne for a long time. Mm. There, there is a whole range of jobs in the public sector and in the parliamentary sector where the state likes to promote people who they know, the mm. job is on their capabilities. And the reason is because those people will be entirely reliant on advice. Yeah. So Maurice Payne is not capable of giving a one-on-one -on -one press conference. I don't think she's given one in her entire period as Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yeah, well, reason is because she's terrified of appearing in front of a camera with unscripted questions from an audience she doesn't control. She can't do it. And she's the person making Australia's strategic decisions. Mm. Okay. Now, I'm saying to you, I don't blame Maurice. I respect she's in the racket. She's getting something out of it. I say good luck to her. Everybody's got to feed themselves somehow. Okay. <laughs> now, what I'm saying to you is you have to do the, geome the, the geometry when it comes to foreign policy. Right. There was a sign, the very first university, we've already discussed this, Plato's Academy, he had a sign on the mm -hmm. gate. As you walked into the academy, there was a sign which is very famous. And it says, I'm not going to ask you to recite it, although I know you could, Tofak. Oh, um, oh, oh, um, yes, absolutely. Um, 100%. No I, uh, which one, language would you like it in? Yeah, let <laughs> obviously it was in the original Greek, but let no one unfamiliar with geometry enter here. Hmm. Um, you know, the exact word, let no one who has not mastered geometry uh, enter here, something like that. And what Plato has said is, sure, we're students of philosophy, but it must be grounded in reality. And, right. the, and, and mathematics gives us this, what has been described as an unreasonable approximation of reality. We don't know why it works so well. We wish the rest of philosophy worked as well as mathematics. But <laughs> the point is <clears throat> that... <clears throat> The intelligence agencies have an advantage over the uh, domestic governments, okay, right. which is that Scott Morrison is, in effect, the Prime Minister of one sovereign state, whereas the so-called Five Eyes are sharing information across five. Sure. Now, the first bit of maths you've got is you've got a ratio of five to one in each case. Whether you are Boris Johnson or Jacinda Ardern or Justin Trudeau or Joe Biden or Malcolm uh, Scott Morrison, Malcolm Turnbull, they're interchangeable. There's no difference between them. Okay, They're <laughs> all widgets. You could flip the whole pack and put Jacinda in Canberra and Justin in Auckland and Boris in Washington. Wellington, I believe, but yes. It, Wellington. It, it would make no difference Yeah. Okay, because they are generic commodities of the deep state. Mm. Okay, so you've got the first ratio is there's a power which comes from the spread of the agencies who are able to share data across five countries. The second point is that you've got successive governments which are going from, you know, Whitlam to Fraser to um, Hawke to um, Howard to Turnbull yeah. to whatever, Rudd, mm. Gillard, Turnbull, blah, blah. Each time a government, a party, a government gets going, it gets cut down or the leader gets cut down or it gets changed. Yeah. The agency yeah. march yeah. forward. Yeah. So they have this linear accretion of information, okay, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. the domestic political leader does not possess. Yeah. No. Okay. So why are they so rubbish at it then? Well, the next point, just so you get the geometry clear. Okay. okay? So yep. you know when you pick up the Australian newspaper, there is no area where all of the mastheads are colanders, are Swiss cheese, are completely compromised. Mm -hmm. um, if Paul Keating opens his mouth on foreign policy, you should listen to him right. because he's basically the only integer in the Australian Labor Party who is not fully compromised to the agencies. Okay. And when WikiLeaks revealed it, we found that all of these Labor figures – I mean, Paul Howes, you know, uh, is a senior figure at mm. KPMG, mm. whereas the American embassy will say Paul Howes is, is a valued asset who basically can't go a week without traipsing in and out of the US embassy, spilling his guts about whatever significant commercial contracts are taking. You know, I mean, that's yeah. their evidence, not mine. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Then you go to Mark R. Bibb, then you go to, you know... Um, 
all of them, the you know, were up to their eyeballs in U.S. intelligence. Okay, mm. and so before they moved, before Gillard moved, she had a visit from the American embassy when she's about to move against Rudd. And mm. the American embassy basically said, look, we understand you're about to move against Rudd. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, you know, because we know way before the Australian people, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. what I'm saying to you is both sides, okay? And, and the US has a view that they like to know before it takes place if there's going to be a change of leader and they don't want any significant change in policy mm. in relation to the key questions, which are, you know, US strategic interests as, as defined. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to say to you is, so you've got this one is you've got the longevity of the agencies collecting information, including, say, for example, Sam, brother Sam, uh, Sam, the Iranian uh, lab, um, Sam, uh, who got sacked, former secretary of the New South Wales Division of the uh, Labor Party, who was taped having a conversation yes with- ringing a bell very strongly but i can't get his last name um, and uh it's a smart bloke he's a good bloke uh, in a way uh but you know yeah. he was in the uh in the racket yeah but you know the us oh well i say the us we don't know we were never told mm. who was the intelligence service that was listening to the phone of an australian senator and who, when that Australian senator came out and said, you know what, maybe I think we should rethink our position of China in the South China Sea, 10 minutes later, that guy was bundled out of parliament uh, like a George Gregan tackle. Sam uh, Dastiari. Thank you, Dastiari. viewers. There's a bunch of you who have thrown the name in. Thank you. Um, and he was bundled out so fast it would make your head spin. Yeah. Because a foreign intelligence service was listening to a conversation he had with the donor and he said to the donor, look, I think you ought to be careful because my phone calls are probably being listened to. Now, I'm saying to you, Topher, that these guys um, have uh, are laps ahead of the government. And any time somebody pops their head up and looks like they might be putting a view which the agencies don't approve of, the agencies have been following those guys They've been following their internet activity. They've mm. been following their donor relationships. Mm. They've been following their private lives. Mm. They've been following their commercial relationships. They've got more information on the individuals concerned than the individuals have in themselves. And I'm saying to you that the area in which the mainstream media is most completely compromised is the extent to which they will cut, paste, and reprint intelligence agency dogma as if it's news. Yeah. And the last thing I'm going to say to you, we have these two statements, okay? We have two uh, words, two nouns. One is intelligence. Uh, one is counterintelligence. Sure. Well, I will invite you to, to give me a just what do you, what do you think is the difference between intelligence and counterintelligence? We find that the guy, one of the senior guys who was leading the campaign to destroy uh, Donald Trump on the basis of the Christopher Steele dossier of Golden Chows, which turned out to be a complete fabrication funded by the Democratic mm-hmm. Party. Mm-hmm. Um, the bloke who um, was leading the charge within the U.S. government against an incoming Democrat, you know. Uh, I'm trying to remember Kennedy. his name. Steele? Was that the Steele Steel dossier? Steele was the guy who assembled the dossier. I'm inclined to say Andy McCarthy. Andy. Anyway. His I, did, I did know that once upon a time, but anyway. The head of counterintelligence at the FBI. That was his mm-hmm. title, head of counterintelligence. Mm-hmm. Now, if we say, okay, well, this is the title you give yourself, um, what does it mean? So In- off, the top, off the top of my head, you've asked the question, what, what do they mean? The best that I could do, ah, so Paul Manafort is the name put forward by Daniel Turner. Yeah. Is that is that the guy you're trying to think of? No. Keep anyway, going. Um, so I would say intelligence is an attempt to gather information about an opposing party. Counterintelligence is an attempt to counter their efforts to gather information about you. That's how I would describe it. Okay. I would say um, 
good. Uh, I, I, I broadly be in agreement with you. <clears throat> I would say that the way they do counterintelligence is they seek to <clears throat> intelligence is listening. Counterintelligence is feeding a narrative into the environment. I see. Which yep. strategic so, so misinformation. Correct. And so whether it is always, it's not necessarily always misinformation. Sometimes mm. it may be truthful. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's a question of which information goes in. And I'm going to say that, um, and are they willing to, are the agencies willing to lie mm. in news and media stories in order to support a narrative? No, well, the answer we, is that we, is we know they are. We know they are because they tell us they are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like Pompeo, as a former head of the CIA, when yeah. asked, do we lie? He said, we run whole schools in how to lie. <laughs> Okay, that's Mike Pompeo, that's not me. Yeah, uh, no, that's not an accusation. I'm reporting a statement from Mike Pompeo. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, what the agencies, and it raises a very, very important series of questions which democracies apparently are unwilling to ask. Right. Mahatma Gandhi, you talk about India. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, under his doctrine of um, Satyagraha, mm. which means truth force when he was conducting the citizen-led, you're a citizen journalist, you are a Mahatma Gandhi documenting and recording, you know, from a citizen perspective. And when he was looking at the injustice being suffered by the sort of indentured labour in yeah. the Indian sort of cotton and dye industries, and he ran a whole series of trials because he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, educated in law and admitted, I think, to the Earls of, of, of Court in, in London. Mm. Um, he was, you know, the landlords were in the frame and one night a senior bureaucrat came to him with a big box of documents and said, uh, Mahatma, um, Here's the dirt. Mm. Uh, I'll give you the whole lot. Uh, straight off the back of the truck. Every landlord, every transaction, every corrupt dealing, every bribe, it's all here. And MK Gandhi said to him, um, look, I appreciate your interest, but are you prepared to uh, put your name on it and release it to me publicly? And the bureaucrat said, well, no, that would cost me my job in the public That's service. Right. Yeah, of course. And uh, Gandhi said, well, take your box because we don't accept like material. Mm. Because we said, because Gandhi said, we believe that the damage to institutions of the leak is greater than the benefit we get from the knowledge. Mm. This is a sort of a philosophical argument we can have about WikiLeaks, which I think is the weakest um, the, the sort of morally weakest point of the WikiLeaks thesis, <clears throat> but having thought about it uh, and studied it uh, and read it uh, and formed a view about it, um, I have overcome my reservations by other means. Mm. And the, the other means is primarily that the government has demonstrated they are entirely incapable and incompetent of keeping our data secure. So therefore we know that the data is going to leak. The question is what happens to it when it does? Yeah, and, and and who leaks it? <coughs> All right, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you an opportunity, Ross, to to, to bring this uh, this circuitous uh, logical route to 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 landing. Um, before yeah. we take a break, I'm going to play a short video to allow myself and viewers to uh, empty their bladders. I nearly had a riot on my hands in the early days of slow chats, and when we started going for three hours and four hours of people insisting that I had to give them a break because they didn't want to walk away from the screen for a few minutes. Right. And not everyone's comfortable taking their laptops into the toilet with them. Sure. So would you like yeah. to land that thought and then we'll move okay. on That's to the I want to land with you is, all right, yeah. that the agencies have sheared off. Yeah. There used to be this, the US operates 28 separate intelligence services. Yeah, wow. Okay. Um, and... The agencies are actually run, UK, American foreign policy is not actually run out of Washington, in my opinion, it's run out of 
uh, MI6 and MI5 in out of the UK. UK, out of the UK. It's basically, you know, it's significantly influenced by the Rhodes programs by Oxford and Cambridge, recruiting the best and the brightest, sending them out to the four corners of the earth, selling them on this sort of enlightenment project. Mm -hmm. Which, frankly, if they were defending an enlightenment project, I would mm -hmm. support the intelligence services. <laughs> Um, but it turns out they've given up. Yeah. Right? And so you've got, here we've got that the five eyes, you know, recently apparently reduced to the three eyes uh, when mm -hmm. Canada said, you know, we don't want to play ball in your war against China, have formed the view that it is in the interest of the Western world to be engaged in a permanent um destructive relationship with China and Russia. Right. And, you know, uh, let's put North Korea to one side. They're a separate and more difficult proposition. Let's sure. put Iran, let's put Iran to one side and recognize that the Shia uh, present a different, qualitatively different question and problem. Let's I agree that, that you and I are both instinctively um, you know, uh, unwearying supporters of the state of Israel, not saying that Israel is incapable of error um, sure. or that it cannot be criticised, but that we instinctively support uh, the right to exist. The Their right to exist, yes. Um, but putting those issues to one side, I'm saying to you that the agencies uh, with respect um, have... Um, sheared off any kind of accountability to mm -hmm. an individual sovereign uh, democratic Australia. Right. And that the agencies of the Five Eyes are acting as they understand it in the interests of the Five Eyes, not in the okay. interests of the Australian people. Sure. So, so if, if uh, MI5, uh, the FBI, the DAJ, the CIA decide... We're going to make um, Xi Jinping the bogeyman and we're going to fit up uh, Vladimir Putin as an ex-KGB um, oligarch, uh, yep. richest man in the world. And that, uh, and we're going to build a massive narrative around the uh, poisoning of Sergei Skripal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in um, then Australia, Maurice Payne, you're going to play ball, honey. Here are your speaking notes, yeah. and this is what, we're, and we're going to go down to Peter Jennings, the daft Peter Jennings at, at, at Aspie, who hasn't had an interesting idea in 20 years, who is sponsored by Boeing and Raytheon and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to say, okay, Pete, mate, uh, here's the next story for the Australian. And they're going to ring up the editor of the Australian. He's going to go, no worries, love. Uh, bang, yeah. straight on to, uh, you know, page three. Page three, yeah. Uh, as yeah. if. This is news, and yeah. I, I, I just I, I just say we we've, we've got to grow up a little bit, and the agencies. Uh, the the last thing I will say: counterintelligence means seeding the environment with a set of ideas, regardless of the veracity or truth of the statements being made. Right. And the rubbish that we I'm happy for criticism of the of the Chinese Communist Party, and I'm happy for criticism of uh, Vladimir Putin. But I want facts, I want balance, I want genuine insight, I want to start the story with an open mind, yeah. and I want us to seriously consider where Australia's interests are. When Vladimir Putin came to Australia under Kevin Rudd's leadership, he said, look, Kevin, what do you think we can do together? We're open-minded. And Kevin Rudd scoffingly said, uh, we've got no common interests uh, with Russia. Yeah, right. Russia for uh, for 200 years has been a world leader in metallurgy. Russia is one of three countries which has put uh, a man into uh, space. Orbit. Yeah. Uh, you know, Australia has got this daft little space agency run by a girl who's probably never built a pagoda in the backyard. And Vladimir Putin's saying, let's let's work together. And 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 Kevin Rudd says, um, uh, yeah. we've got no interest in common. Uh, with you, you know, All right. Australians, wake up. Uh, we are not being the foreign policy narrative taking place in the Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian Financial Review, the Daily Telegraph and the Australian has got all the nutrition 
of the soup in a North Korean gulag. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to put a pin in it. Now, I'm going to play a video. It goes for about five minutes. This is your chance to go and take a loo break, do whatever you need to do. Because when we come back, Ross, if you're if you're still up for it, I want to come to much more domestic affairs. And AAPI made the comment earlier, there's not a lot of point talking about foreign affairs when we're on a sinking ship ourselves. So yep. I want to talk about, are we on a sinking ship? What's the situation yep. economically? What's our outlook? Where do we think this is going to go? What should people like you and I and the people watching be doing, given what we do know about the current situation? That's what's coming up. But first, I'm going to play you a video. This is your chance. Take a loo break. Do what you need to do. This video is called The Little Government That Could. And I made this back in, I believe, 2016, I think. And uh, I re I just changed a few things for Victoria because I made it originally for Americans. This was a, a tribute to my American viewers, my American followers. I made it for them. But unfortunately, the lessons and the message became very, very real and very, very true in Victoria once COVID came along. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to be right back with Ross Cameron. For my American friends, once upon a time, I was a newborn government. I was a very small government and, and not very strong. I had many fathers, but they were very mean and they didn't want me to grow up. They wrote some very strict rules which made it very hard for me to grow up and, and be like the big governments overseas. But like all little governments, I still dreamed of a day when I would grow up and be big and strong. Well, the years slipped by and, and whilst I got older, I didn't get much bigger or much stronger. But after enough years had passed, none of my fathers were alive anymore. All of those men who wrote those nasty rules were gone. And I realized a funny thing. Though I was only little, I had now been around longer than anyone alive. And my people began to forget why my fathers wrote those silly rules. And so I, the little government, waited and watched. I knew my chance to grow up would finally come. And if I was patient, my dream of being a big, strong government would finally come true. And as this time passed, my people slept soundly in their beds. Until one day there was trouble. The economy was bad and some people were going through very hard times. Well, I knew my time had come. I knew exactly what to do. I'll look after you, I said. I'll get everything back under control. All you have to do is, is let me get a little bit bigger and, and a little bit stronger and, and break those rules just, just a little bit. And I promise I'll look after you. And my people thought about it and for as long as any of them could remember their little government had been very obedient and, and, and caused very little trouble at all. And they were much nicer people than my fathers were. And so of course they said, yes, we will let you grow a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger and break those rules just a little bit. And you'll look after us and keep everything under control. So I grew a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. And, and I felt better. And my people felt better too. They were mostly very happy. And they went back to sleep and slept soundly in their beds. Well, from then on, whenever there was trouble, every time someone needed help, I would spring into action. I can help. Let me save you from your trouble. I will get everything back under control. And every time I helped, of course, I, I got a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger and, and a little bit happier. And, and those awful rules which my fathers wrote way back when I was born, they were almost forgotten. Well, soon I'd become as, as big and as strong as the governments overseas, which, which my silly fathers ran away from all those years ago, but, but no one seemed to mind. So I kept growing bigger and, and stronger. And well, my people, that they seemed happy. They kept sleeping. And soon I was so big and, and so strong, I was able to do anything. Whatever you needed, I could provide. If you were in danger, I could protect you, even if that meant protecting you from yourself. No matter what the situation, I'm there for you. No job too big or too small. Well, of course, it isn't easy to look after everyone all at once. So to make things easier, I had to divide people into groups and the cost of some groups had to be paid by other groups. And there were some groups that I liked and there were other groups that, well, anyway, there were a few very special groups that helped me to look after the people and, and some that even helped me to, to grow bigger and stronger. And I liked those groups very much. They're my friends. And for a very long time, my people slept soundly in their beds, secure in the knowledge that their big and strong government had everything under control. But some of my people didn't appreciate all of the good things that I was doing for them. 
Some of these ungrateful people began to suggest that I'd become too big and should be made small again. That those old forgotten rules should be applied once again. They wanted to turn me back into that little, weak government that I used to be. See, I understand something that these ungrateful people do not. They can't live without me. They need me, even if they don't know it. Well, I did what I had to do. I have to protect myself from these naive people. I have to make them obey me for everyone's sake. But they just don't understand. They refuse to go back to sleep. Well, lately things have been very dangerous for me. Some of these naive, ungrateful people even tried to take me, their government, over and force me to obey those archaic rules. And for a little while, it looked like they might succeed. But I have friends, remember? And just when it seemed that all might be lost, that all of my hard work and all of our progress might be lost, that I was about to be taken back to my childhood, well, my friends stepped in. And smart people, good people, who understand how important I am, did whatever it took to ensure that this big and strong government would never become small and weak again, and that I would always be able to keep everything under control. Well, here we are. I am your government, and I am big, and I am strong, and you need me. And I have everything under control. All you need to do is go back to sleep. Yes, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. So that was something that I did almost on a whim in 2012 for the, there was an upcoming US um, presidential election. It was um, Mitt Romney versus Barack Obama. And uh, that was my message to the followers that I have in the US at the time. And um, it was sometime in 2020 that I remembered this particular project and went, hang on. Um, that's kind of relevant, kind of relevant to Australia now. So obviously that video, it still clearly was made for America, but I think the lessons are, uh, are very real and very relevant into, into Australia. So anyway, uh, that was that. Back to Ross Cameron, and uh, I'm just going to bring him back on now. Uh, Ross, thank you for sticking with me. I always get a bit nervous. Are they going to come back from the, the loo break or are they just going to go to bed? You know, they're going well, to they give up on me. I'm a little bit like you. Um, breaking isn't it um but um you know we if we are stokes um we accept uh that we are simply uh you know we come from elements in nature to which we shall return and yes. if we somehow presume that we may resist uh this process uh, then we are children uh, not adults um, you know what I should have done while um, I think I, I should have uh, uh, recharged my computer, but I think I can solve that technical problem in the interim. But go ahead, mate. Shoot, give me give me your best uh, next one. Okay. So we we did mention earlier the amount of profligate spending going on here in Australia. I want to come I want to come right back to Australia. I want to come right back to home. Uh, we've, we've talked about China, we've covered a few different fo foreign policy areas, but I think AAPI had a good point. Uh, what's the point talking about foreign policy when we ourselves are sitting in a sinking ship? Is sinking ship fair? Do you, What do you see as the prospects that we have as a result of the amount of spending, the amount of debt that yeah. we are currently getting ourselves into? Yeah, well... Um... Look, I, I think this is... Who asked this question, by the way? Who gets credit for the going to the kernel of the matter? Uh, in terms of uh, during this chat? Yeah. It was That's a chap just calls himself AAPI. Okay. I um, have to scroll up a long... Nah, way don't worry, don't down. worry. I don't want to... Yeah. I just thought it was easy. We should uh, just, just acknowledge our contributors. Um, look, um, yeah, the the... 
you know, in the in the context of the Tofa Slow chat, okay, we're we're actually uh, swearing, you know, to the gods uh, of Olympus um, or to the, uh, you know, the the Palestinian carpenter uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who may well be uh, a revelation of the immortal, um, to uh, Yahweh, uh, the God whose name shall not be spoken, uh, but who is still worshipped by a tiny little tribe of, what are there? How many Jews are there? I'm guessing there's less than 20 million Jews globally. <clears throat> um, that we're going to try to be honest, you know, we, that you and I are going to try and tell each other what we actually think. We'll do uh, our best. I have to say to you that... Um, I think Australia is in deep uh, decline. And um, the question of, of, of whether it can be turned around um, is an absolutely live question. Um, and I would say if, you, if, if it was Betfair, um, just putting a market on, <laughs> can, can Australia be salvaged? Yeah. Um, can Australia avoid a sort of um, a dissolution illiquidity uh, event? I say, well, okay, if we are people of reason, how do we go about um, answering the question on the basis of evidence and using our reason rather than our instincts or our feelings, um, our uh, vested interests? Um I would say the first point, you know, I, I would turn again, firstly, to history and say, what do we learn from? It's a good start. Yep. Um, so then if we go to someone we've mentioned before, Will Durant, who tracked the, who tracked 20 civilizations over 10,000 years. Mm. Uh, we could go to somebody like... David Hume, who wrote the um, history of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688. Subsequently wrote uh, a very influential, David Hume I re is one of my heroes, you know, one of the brightest lights, the anchor of the Scottish Enlightenment, one of the brightest mm -hmm. minds in history. Mm -hmm. And he wrote <clears throat> an essay which is called something like, it could be wrong, but it's called The History of the Progress of the Arts and Sciences. Okay. Um, it probably has a slightly longer title than that, but that's the short version. And he looks at this question. He says, you know, why is it that we see in different epochs of history in different places this sort of rising to a zenith, a crescendo, an apotheosis of genius Right. In, whether that be in Athens in the golden age of 200 years from, you know, let's say uh, 500 from, you know, from the repelling of the Persian invasion to Alexander the Great. Mm. Um, then we go to Rome. And, you know, Rome is interesting in that Rome from its founding and we think about, I think it's 752 BC, mm. it goes through a sort of ups and downs. It has its mm. moments, it's assaulted, it was nearly destroyed by Hannibal, you know, it mm. sort of bounced back It eventually then destroyed Carthage, invaded and uh, overswept Athens. It adopted Greece <clears throat> voluntarily, cultural ideas, but it then had this period of let's call it the Pax Romana, for 200 years. Yeah. Uh, in which we find Marcus Aurelius is the end point, the final bookmark. For those who are interested, this is what I'm smoking. Some people are genuinely interested, so I'm going to show it to you. Yeah. It's an undercrown uh, nasty fritas. Yeah. Sorry, continue. Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, so Marcus is kind of the end of the, of, of the Pax Romana and the beginning of the decline. Uh, with Commodus, his stupid, uh, vicious, um, venal son. Um, 
Then we go into a period, I mean, we had a magnificent period before that. If we go back before Homer and the Greeks, um, we had Crete and the Minoans, <clears throat> who were essentially the proto-Greeks. And we had at least really a 600-year Pax Minoa. Yeah, right. And the Greek temp and, and the Minoan palace culture in which there is virtually no evidence of military equipment or defensive walls. Right. But absolutely beautiful art, beautiful women, beautiful uh, jewellery, precious metals, fine, uh, you know, Daedalus, the beginning of really Freemasonry, uh, you know, uh, used as not as a proper noun, but the beginning of mm. stone, really important, um, <clears throat> design of architecture, the building of the, um, you know, of, of the of the, of the labyrinth and so forth. The first attempts at flight um, were really Cretan by no one, and possibly um, they gave us amongst the first examples of language. But then they collapsed. And David Hume's argument, as you look across history, you know, we could go to the European. Uh, Reformation, indeed, Hume himself is the flower of the Scottish Enlightenment. Okay. Then Hume, Hume and the Scottish Enlightenment, I'm going to put a pin in you there. Yeah. Um, so a concerned world citizen, can I just say, if you're not keeping up, it's okay, you can go do something else, all right? He says, holy geez, Ross Cameron is just blathering at this point, treading water, lol. Mate, you clearly can't keep up. Thank you for contributing a bunch of comments and feeding the YouTube algorithm for me. I do appreciate that. But if you're having trouble keeping up and you can't you can't keep pace with Ross Cameron here, please go and do something else for your own sake. Um, but look, if you want to hang around and keep on feeding the algorithm, then that's great. That's fantastic. I'm happy either way. Up to you. Uh, so the the um, the uh, oh goodness, now I've lost his name. What, what who was it you just mentioned? Uh, David Hume. Hume. And thank so you. Hume. And so we come back to Hume. What we're really doing is asking how does a rational person approach the question? Since we're all Australian citizens, we're inside the story. We're sure. trying to get perspective on where this story fits. And we're so close to it, you know, that it's very, very hard to see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Be being yeah. in history is very different to reading about history. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ross, we've lost you. I promise that wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't, I haven't unpersoned Ross. I didn't boot him. I promise. Uh, he hasn't been fired again. <laughs> um, hopefully he will, uh, he will reappear shortly. He's still technically, he's still linked. You can still see him there. My computer still thinks that it has him to some degree. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see whether, um, whether he comes back in just a minute. So, Okay. I, I, I want to address a couple of things in the comments here. Firstly, if you're not having fun, go do something else. I mean, seriously, guys, what, what do you think this is? Like, you've got Netflix, like, go and watch, what is it, Love Island or whatever the latest, I don't know, whatever it is. If you don't want to listen to people having serious conversations about meaningful stuff, go do something else. Uh, if you're here, thank you so much for being here. I do appreciate it, and I really enjoy having you guys along for the ride, and uh, I enjoy having guests like Ross. Uh, there we go. He's finally dropped out, so hopefully he will click the button again. And uh, he'll rejoin us very, very soon. But we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. I'll give him a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, and I might actually just send him a message. I've been messaging with him. I might just send him a message to let him know that he can rejoin uh, via the same link as what I gave him before, just to make sure that he knows. Uh, rejoin with the same link. Rejoin with the same link. Um, that might well have been his uh, laptop running out of power. Oh, here we go. Here he comes. Now, Ross, did your laptop run out of power? Is that yeah, what happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's Excellent. what's happened to Australia right now. <laughs> we ran out of power. All right. Um, so we, mate, yep. the, the cut, we, I'll, I'll try to bring it in. You know, Rowan would be saying, land it, land it. Land it, <laughs> land it. Come on. Is, Come on, Ross, land it. Hume's argument, okay which is sad to me, which I find sad, is he says that cultures rise to this moment of genius as a consequence of a whole range of factors which he describes. He says, but then once they begin the slide, 
They yeah. never come yeah. back. Historically speaking, it's very hard to argue with that. And that, that's his argument. Now, I say, if you say to me, is Australia, has Australia begun the slide? I say, yes, absolutely. 100%. Um, is the slide currently, I mean, somebody won a Nobel Prize when they figured out that the universe was expanding at an accelerating rate. Mm. Is Australia declining at an accelerating rate? I say, <laughs> yes, absolutely. If we say, okay, well, what are the factual indicators of this decline? I don't want to be a, um, you know, Tony Abbott described them as what is the Irish, you know, not Hanrahan or someone who's always, you know, saying Henny Penny, the sky's falling in, the older generation lamenting the younger. But my observation, for example, of the decline in civility, you know, the most obvious, unarguable, factual problem Australia has is the birth rate. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, demography is destiny. And if it, you can't... It's right there in numbers, yep. If, if you can't reproduce your population, you're in decline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, basically, no male in this country can get an erection, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty much over. Again, uh, Ross, speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know... It, it, it's it's crude in a way it's crass but it's, it's look, where the rubber meets the road if you can't reproduce your population you've got no correct. future and this is why yep. countries like japan italy etc greece they've got no future because they they don't have a motive to live mm -hmm. and so at a time where for example gladys berejiklian finally secures her own mandate as premier gets elected to government her very first act is to rush uh, to implement a deal to increase the number of abortions taking place in New South Wales public hospitals before she'd even discussed it with her party room, with her colleagues, had never announced it as mm. an election policy, but her very first top priority is to increase the number of abortions. Well, at the same time, Xi Jinping is coming out and announcing that the, 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 the one-child policy was scrapped, replaced mm -hmm. with the two-child policy, and Xi Jinping comes out and says, now we're going for the three-child policy because yes. they can see they've got a demographic hole, which yes. if they want to have a future, they need to fill it. So he's yes. saying, now for the first time, you're seeing Chinese mothers in two generations walking down the street holding a hand of a child in each hand. And I'm saying to you whether they can overcome their demographic challenges. Um, you know, they're, they're, that they're, they're trying to do the right thing. So we're trying to we're trying to kill more. We're trying to terminate more pregnancies. They're trying to create more pregnancies. So then we move from there to debt. Uh, you know, we move from there. To, we've got something called the um, you know Australian National Energy Security Board. Okay, mm -hmm. which is run by a uh, Malcolm Turnbull appointee. Oh, that's going to end well. And um, who is a former, you know, doctor, whatever her name is, I forget, she used to run Sydney Water. But this is a, there is no more Orwellian uh, title for a bureaucracy than the Australian National Energy Security Board, because that board is, Ab Kerry Schott, I think is, the, is her name, right. is absolutely dedicated to the destruction of both the reliability of the energy board and the affordability of the, of the energy grid and the affordability of electricity. Yeah. So when you've got a country um, which, if you say, are we in decline, if your guest says, are we in decline, I say, if you have managed, when you've got the most world's most abundant supply of black coke and coal, when you own 40% of the world's uranium, um, when you have got abundant supplies of natural gas, mm -hmm. uh, when you've got a vast continent uh, full of sunshine, if you have doubled the price of electricity in 10 years, uh, you are the dumbest dope in the playground and your country is in decline. Yeah. And what we know, and one of the reasons why we know that, you know, uh, global warming uh, hasn't got a moral feather to fly with, is because the number of people who die on Earth as a consequence of cold uh, is ten times the number who die. Correct. As a Correct. Heat. You get it when you get a massive winter storm going through the US. A yeah. a wealthy country, 
Uh, they had one in Texas in late 2020, if I recall correctly, or early 2021. Yep. Uh, more than 700 excess deaths in one week mm. as a result of a cold snap that took down the power yep. grid. So we're in a situation where we've got, you know, um, Australian coal is the world standard for calorific content. Uh, the rest of the world's coal is judged against Australia's best black coke and coal, yet our best idea is to leave it in the ground. And yeah. So we've got a situation where obviously energy st uh, educational standards are in uh, rapid decline. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have just <coughs> deeply fractured, uh, splintered uh, and divided the population. If we move into the more sort of inchoate, into the more almost spiritual, if you like, mm. but I say nonetheless, relevant that one of the greatest and possibly the single greatest asset that any population has in any place around the world is the level of trust and confidence between unrelated citizens so when two yeah. strangers walk past each other in melbourne yeah when they walk past each other on the street or in a public park is there a natural assumption of trust mm. or is there an assumption of fear and, and historically, we have been a very high trust society, an unusually high trust society. When we go on Gumtree or when we go on, you know, the, the trading post as it used to be, there was an assumption that the other person was in good faith advertising a thing that they actually had, that they were actually going to sell you for the price that they advertise, etc. These are things that we Australians take for granted. This is not necessarily normal around the world. And this was something of a shock to me when I discovered that. Amen. And, you know, the another classic uh, Jewish genius, uh, Jane Jacobs, wrote one of, the, you know, one of the important books of the 20th century, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And she made this observation most powerfully um, mm -hmm. when she said that she talked about the footpath. She has a whole chapter in the book dedicated to the footpath, what she calls the sidewalk. Um, and she says, you know, there is someone on each street who sort of feels responsible for their block, for their yeah. segment of the street. Yeah. Maybe they're a little bit of a busybody, you know, maybe <laughs> but they care about it, you know, and if the kids are getting out of line, yeah, there is a force which pushes back against the kids yeah. getting out of line. And yeah. if the light is broken, there is somebody who rings up the city council's office and says the light is broken. And if there is yeah. graffiti on the side of the wall, there's somebody who says, uh, I'm going to clean it or I'm going to get someone to clean it. And yeah. that is what became known, you know, in anthropology as social capital. And I just say to you, when you've got the political leadership who has decided, for example, here that the fault line, the fissure, the moment at which the ice uh, cleaved, um, you know, from the glacier is over vaccination status. Yeah. And you've now got a situation, for example, in Western Australia, where going back to, you know, our beautiful J.S. Mill, who is the most lucid um, of all on the tyranny of majorities. Mm. What we are about to witness, okay, is a situation where you've got a Premier who's enjoying, let's say, for the sake of the argument, a 70% approval rating. He has basically allocated unto himself the right to do whatever the he wants. Yeah. He has decided that there are votes to be gained in persecuting, ostracising, vilifying, smearing, scapegoating um a minority group in in his state yeah. now we don't give him the award in the australia for the most venal uh the only uh because this this is the brand new australian sport uh which we discovered and displayed in full i mean the uh in the australian open uh in relation to um dokovich mm in which Medvedev comes out of the tournament saying, I've never experienced the levels of um, vitriol and insult and unsporting conduct from a crowd that I just did in the city of Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, then you have Albo, 
you know, uh, Mr. Minuscule, Albo, who you have to go look for with a microscope uh, to find his convictions, he decides his great act of bravery, his Theseus, you know, uh, going to attack the Minotaur, is he's going to send a letter to Djokovic in Serbia saying, even if you think about coming back to Australia, I'm, if I get elected, I'm going to make it really, really difficult for you. Okay. Now, this is amongst the most venal, um, self-interested, transparently um, vacuous, um, majoritarian uh, behaviour, which is unbecoming of an Australian and humiliating to any Australian citizen. If you'd said to me two years ago, Topher, in two years' time, you will be embarrassed to be an Australian. I would have said, fuck off. There is no way, there is, what could Australia possibly do to damage its outstanding global reputation so badly that I would actually feel embarrassed? And to, for context, when I was seven years old, my family had a, a, a wonderful year in, in 1988. We actually made really good, uh, my, my dad made really good money for one year in, in his entire life. Um, and as a result, at the end of 1989, we went on a holiday. We spent three months in the US and in Europe. And I came across this thing that I'd never seen before. We were in France and in France, no one spoke English at all until they discovered that you were not English, you were Australian. And then about 50% of people spoke fluent English. It was incredible. It was a miracle, right? It was this incredible miracle that happened right before your eyes. Uh, and my older brother, who was on the same trip, he had a jumper that had the Australian flag. And he took to wearing that jumper because it would, it would mark us out as Australian rather than English. And people would talk to us. And the Australian brand, I've spent time in the US, you know, multiple, multiple trips to the US. The Australian brand was incredibly strong. Just the fact that you are from Australia suddenly opens doors and gets you into places that, that, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. If you'd said to me two years ago, Topher, you were going to be embarrassed in two years' time to be an Australian, I would have said, you are nuts. Yeah. Fast forward to today, and honestly, there are times when I have hung my head in shame from locking out Australian citizens, Australian passport holders from returning home to this whole Novak Djokovic absolute debacle to what's happened on the streets of Melbourne as I chronicled in Battleground Melbourne. There are moments when I have gen felt genuine embarrassment for the country that I was born in. And it shouldn't be that way. Well, look, this is the question. Can Australia um, defy the David Hume sort of trend, the um, Will Durant rise and fall of civilizations trend? Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, I think you could say that once they went into the sort of the third civil war in Rome in <clears throat> sort of three decades and you had Caesar was dead, um, uh, the second triumvirate had fallen apart, you had sort of Mark Anthony and uh, Augustus slugging it out. I think a lot of people thought the Roman story was approaching uh, its end. You know, yeah. But they simply were not going to be able to sustain uh, this operation. It turned out they were unable to sustain, to sustain the Republic, but they were under Augustus um, and Libya, to be fair. Um, they were able to reset. Um, and, and reform. This is what I find interesting about the Roman, I was about to say Roman Empire, but of course that, that defines a certain period. The, the, the Roman project, I guess, took so many different forms over the, the centuries of its sort of uh, ascendance uh, as, as the, the leading, I guess, culture, the leading political system, whatever you want to call it in the world, uh, mm -hmm. from a republic to an empire to, to various forms that it took. Instead of failing the way that most empires do, it reformed and managed to somehow continue. Mm. And look, this is the sad thing that we never really get to talk about is, is, is what if we were starting from a blank page, if we were not, in the end, Edward Gibbon says Rome failed because the vested interests 
uh, just completely squashed, strangled, suffocated the nascent emerging interests and the yeah. American people, you know, was destroyed. And if we said, well, what, you know, what would our perfect world look like, which regrettably we, we don't spend enough time talking about because yeah. we spend uh, uh, more time in lamentations and, you know, what should I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that, yes. Uh, and, and frankly... You know, when I see uh, a company like Pfizer, who's not taking responsibility for vaccine injury, applying for the right mm -hmm. to get uh, mm -hmm. with an experiment. Being indemnified from their own product. Um, you know, I think people uh, are entitled uh, to, to some lamentation. And we obviously, we won't understand the full consequences for, for some years to come. But if we resist the uh, sackcloth and ashes and say, well, is there a plausible path out? Yes, that, this is, the, I think, the key question of our time. One, one, of, the, one of the reasons why I continue uh, to hope is because I think there is a plausible path. I mean, sometimes you find yourself in a situation where, uh, you know, if you were on the other side of the wall in Tyre when Alexander the Great had built the uh, pontoon, uh, yeah. and, uh, you or indeed, if you were inside the city of Athens suffering the plague, being attacked by the Spartans, uh, you know. But Australia is not in that situation, and indeed, our great mate um, Marcus Aurelius says <laughs> um, that you know when you have lost your reason, lost touch with reason. The good news is that if you will return from your fantasy uh, or from your um, racket, whatever, to reason, uh, those who have been calling you an ape, you know, within mm. 10 days will be calling you a god. You can mm, actually wow. turn the thing around quite quickly mm. if you're prepared to give up the things that haven't worked, you know. But here we say and say in, in Aboriginal affairs in Australia, we've been operating a policy which for seven decades has been making things worse and worse and worse, but there is just absolutely no impulse. No, that's right. That's what right. we were doing last year, we'll do next year. Now, I'm saying to you that there is enough gas in the Betterloo Basin to do a deal under which, you know, if I were the gas developer, I would be inclined to say to the government, I will give free gas to every Australian citizen if I'm I'm know. sorry to say I actually don't know where the basin you just mentioned is. Can you enlighten me? Just assume Northern Territory. Okay, cool. Northern Territory, where it's it is the most massive source of underground uh, gas, and the two hundred companies at the invitation of the uh, what was then the Liberal National Government. Um, came and invested uh, a couple of hundred million bucks doing the pre-feasibility yeah. and looking at how you would build the pipeline and the port and do the extraction and so forth. And then the Labor government arrived and just cancelled all the contracts. Yeah. Uh, so we don't want to. So um, likewise, um, the amount of, you know, I mean, as you go on, whatever all body you're looking at, <clears throat> Um, probably gets more expensive over time. But, I mean, we know from Olympic Dam, Olympic Dam is one of the richest ore bodies in the world in the South Australian desert at Roxby Downs. Mm. Mm. Um, it would take... Uh, we have approved an environmental impact study to change Olympic Dam from an uh, underground to an open cut mine. Okay. But what you have to do, the problem is the ore is sort of four years worth of earth removal yeah. of oil underground. So the um, leadership of BHP had a budget of $2,000 million for truck tyres. Two billion bucks for truck tyres. $2 billion for truck tyres to just to remove the overburden before you get to the ore. I'm in the wrong industry. I should be making truck tyres. Okay. But in the end, BHP's board looked at the project, and even though it makes compelling economic sense, they just said, we don't think Australia is an environment which is safe. Sovereign, sovereign risk. 
Correct. Sovereign risk. So, this is something I talk about. We've made ourselves look, a risky investment. If, if Australia went out and said, I don't believe, so if Josh Frydenberg wants to say to me, oh, you know, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about the number of carbon dioxide molecules in Earth's atmosphere, which is, you know, 3% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Of the carbon dioxide, 3% of it is human. Um, and he's deeply, deeply worried about it and rising sea levels. I, 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 be I believe we're somewhere between 0.4% and 0.5% carbon dioxide. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do stay across that. Okay. I believe it's, I believe it's, it's a half of 1%. Okay, let's agree it's a very, very small. Very small, very small amount. Yes. And this is why I knew, looking at it in three or four or five minutes, I mean, Archimedes said, give me a lever big enough and a place to stand and I will move the world. Yes. The problem with the lever of climate change is just so small. It's a bee's dick. It has no capacity to move an ecosystem. Obviously, it's a bull story. Putting that to one side, if all of these, you know, federal parliamentarians, Liberal, Labor and Green want to have these highly delicate and refined consciences that must be stroked, you know, down to the last, <laughs> uh, I say to you, um, give us a lower, you know, you, you can have that level of indulgence if you can deliver if, if but but if you're going to say i need a capital gains tax of 50 percent of the value yeah. of whatever yeah. you create in the value whatever increase you create in the value of the assets i'm going to take half yeah i'll say to you you are a very greedy bastard yeah 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 um you are not only greedy you are exceptionally incompetent and to have this abundance of natural resource and sunshine, even if we say we're going to exploit sunshine uh, and we're going to build, you know, um, we're going to use gravity-fed water to deliver more hydro, I say, cool with me. But I say you cannot do it while you've got marginal tax rates up above 40%. You've got um, capital gains tax above 50%. You are setting up armies with spears pointed at capital saying, do not come here. You are so avaricious as a government that you must reach in and molest uh, and frustrate and present impediments and pour molasses over the entire economy. I okay. mean, the motto of the uh, Liberal Party of Australia is how to waste a continent. That's what's going on. That's before we get to water, the amount oh. of water. We're wasting. Okay, can I give an anecdote to give legs to what you've just said? Yeah. Five and a half years ago, I had an idea uh, that I have patented. I am the world's, the, I'm the first person in the world to have come up with this idea. It's been tested now. It's not just a patent. It's actually been tested for those of you know, that know the patent process. Uh, I'm the first person in the world to have had this idea. It relates to uh, rental go-karting. Okay, I'm, I'm a go-karting motor racing enthusiast. It relates to track design around go-karting. I built a business model around that. And I then found a piece of land and I went to council and I said, I want to build an outdoor go-kart on this piece of land. Have a guess, Ross, at how many years it took me in council. And before you answer, the council loved it. They were 100% behind it. They gave me absolutely no trouble at all. This yeah. was just the amount of time it took to get through the normal planning process. How many years do you think it was, Ross? I don't know. It takes a year to get a pagoda approved in the backyard or to change the mm -hmm. colour of the guttering. So um, two or three, tell me. Three and a half. Yeah. I then got dragged into VCAT by one of my future competitors and lost another six months and tens of thousands of dollars worth of my investors' capital. So I've got investors on this project. And now it's been five and a half years since I began working on this project because by the time we got out of VCAT, we were straight into COVID yeah. and we didn't want to go into construction and start building then. Now, five and a half years on, the capital that I raised is no longer enough. You know why? Tell me. Because, because inflation has, has dramatically increased the cost of construction. So now I've got to go back to the market and try and find additional investors into a project that was fully funded to try and invest in Victoria, which has a high degree of sovereign risk because of what we've seen from Daniel Andrews and the response to the coronavirus in order to build a bricks and mortar business in Australia that will generate enormous amounts of tax revenue and create 35 or more jobs. 
I want to create tax revenue and jobs. And they have created four years of obstacles and very nearly killed the entire project. That's how they treat entrepreneurs in this country. Well, look, we're, we're a country. <clears throat> I had a visiting uh, friend some time ago, uh, American, as it turns out, yep. who looked at, you know, the Australian environment and said that you guys went from feudalism to socialism without ever passing through capitalism. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit sympathetic. Um, and there is certainly, uh, increasingly, there is a view that to do business uh, is a sort of a privilege uh, which is granted by the state or not granted. And that you've actually got no right to work. Uh, you've got really no right to engage in commerce. Um, but it may be that the government in its uh, kindness, in its wisdom, is prepared to grant you uh, a privilege permit in order to engage in commerce with others. And indeed, what we find throughout history at the risk of whatever your commentator said, blah, blathering or whatever. Uh, the, the, Ignore him. He's just feeding the, the algorithm. The um, It has actually been the merchants, the Marco Polos uh, of this world, um, who have done more morally the Sinbad, the sailors, um, you know, the Silk Roaders, um, the, the truth is that the relationship between the Taiwanese entrepreneurs and the Chinese capital providers is very close and has been for a long time. And they do lots. The very, very first, fastest, biggest foreign investors in China were Taiwanese. Yeah. And the business people are saying, look, you guys can cut the ribbons and make the speeches and blah, 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 but we're going to build yeah. businesses. Yeah. And we're going to build trust between unrelated people, often speaking different languages, trading different currencies, because we want to make money. Uh, we believe in the profit motive. We want to create space for free people. And yeah. if that's your bent and your instinct and your appetite to take risk and you've got a gift for making widgets or machines or tractors or fertilizer or uh, airplanes or, you know, automotive parts or whatever it is, or designing go-kart tracks, we want to create space to make it happen. Yeah. Um, and, and if we could adopt that view, I think Australia could create a kind of paradise, a kind yeah. of nirvana. We were sort of there in the 70s and 80s, uh, yeah. but we looked that way. But this is, this is also the thing with a lot of the Nordic countries, which are often held up as success stories for socialism. What a lot of people don't acknowledge when they're holding up, oh, see, this state has, you know, universal health care and universal this and universal that. They also have simultaneous with that a very laissez-faire approach toward business. You want to do something? Great. You go for it. You do that thing and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. That goes alongside their welfare state. And that's what funds their welfare state. And for some reason, they seem to be aware of that relationship. You need the one to fund the other. Here in Australia, we seem to be suppressing the source of the revenue, but be very generous in how we spend that revenue. And unfortunately, that's not a, a, a balance that ends well. Yeah. I, I say that one of the reasons it happens, um, you know, and I always tend to be critical of the state, but I'm going to um, return to a criticism of, of the citizen. I'm critical of the state because the, all the people making the decisions are risk protected. And there are, in effect, you know, two groups in the culture. There are those who know their salary is going to fall into the account every second Thursday with mm -hmm. absolute precision, according to an mm -hmm. algorithm, under an automatic funds transfer because the funds are coming from that taxpayer. Correct. The group of workers does not have to meet a particular standard of productivity. It does not have mm -hmm. to find a customer. It does not have to market its product. It does not have to improve its productivity as against what it did the year before. It does mm -hmm. not have to persuade a bank to lend a bank manager to lend it money. It does not have to meet, you know, all it has to, because it owns a monopoly control over yep. raising tax. Yep. On the other side of the equation of this group of people who are absolutely exposed, who are not risk protected, who must, who don't know if the money's going to be in the account or not, who are waiting on getting paid by a customer who may themselves go broke, who Correct. 
you know, who is subject to changes in taste and circumstances, who is exposed to government COVID mobility regulations, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, and, and more specifically, every piece of revenue that a private business makes is revenue that was given to it voluntarily. This, yeah. for me, this is the crux of it. Yeah. Every single transaction in the private uh, economy is voluntary. Both sides of that transaction, the side of the transaction providing the product or the service and the side of the transaction paying money in return for the product or service was voluntary. If you're not happy, you turn around and you walk away and you find somebody else or you just don't spend that money on that thing if you're not happy. As soon as the government gets involved, compulsion gets involved and now all of a sudden we have to give our money over whether we like it or not and as a result value goes out the <clears throat> out the window any idea of a quid pro quo a, a a return for what we have been forced to pay goes out the window and we see that with the inefficiencies that governments introduce into everything they touch you know we, we um you know we're at risk of agreeing with each other too furiously but um <laughs> hey hey we've disagreed we we, it is, we are we can legitimately right. agree now because we've disagreed already we can agree yeah. okay good um <laughs> but i want to sort of if we're trying to be fair and you know um we have to admit like i'm really good at other people's problems um, <laughs> My specialty, I'm very good at it. Um, but, you know, um, this is where Socrates and the Greeks uh, take us back uh, to ourselves. Indeed, um, the Christians and the Jews uh, share the same sort of impulse, is to say, you know, you, you ought to begin with, begin with your own defects indeed the stokes uh, would say they are the defects over which you have the greatest degree of control rather than and, and, and on that point i agree with the stoics at, at everybody else's flaws um which is more congenial and more comfortable um but we have to say as citizens you know if we go back to your viewers question um and i'm happy you know happy to take a few more questions i don't want to you know uh, to uh, stretch the friendship, but you, you don't if, need to sleep, do you? You don't need to sleep tonight at all. No, because we no, can no, keep going. No. Yeah, good. Okay, cool. But, We're good. You know what we see? I believe that um, none of the COVID interventions um, have helped, and almost all of them have made things worse. And my thesis that if the word um covid had never entered the popular discourse if it had had never been if not a single news story had been published in any newspaper um if it had been uh kind of treated as just sort of a version of a worse a more virulent version of the flu mm -hmm. if we had had zero social distancing uh, no new drugs uh, no mandates no masks uh, no interventions whatsoever the net impact on the pop population overall would have been much, much better. That is uh, my opinion. Um, well, it's, it's not just your opinion. Can I bolster that? The research has come out in the last week, a meta-analysis of all of the studies published on the effect of lockdowns uh, was, was encapsulated in a, in a meta-analysis that came out last week, finding that lockdowns achieved approximately a 0.2% reduction in mortality, mm -hmm. which is within the margin of error. Yes. Now, now, in the Australian context, people immediately go, but hang on, we've had so many fewer deaths. Yes, we delayed the inevitable. Yeah. But we're still having to go yeah. through the inevitable now, right? Yeah. We delayed it, and yeah. maybe there are certain circumstances under which there's merit in that, but we didn't actually stop it from happening. Yeah. And this, of course, is exactly uh, what we are now witnessing in Western Australia. And what we are seeing is an incumbent government that has figured out that if it can do a deal where the incumbent government is going to spend uh, tens and twenties and hundreds of millions of dollars, just mm -hmm. uh, in particular in, in a wealth transfer from the taxpayer to the media companies, and the media companies are going to produce daily COVID fear porn and put on the front page of every story. So every day you get up, 
every every device you turn on, you're getting COVID, 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 COVID. Um, you know, I reckon if we had made tinea, uh, you know, <laughs> and every single day you got up and said, oh, the number of people have got tinea today. You know? The number of people in the hospital with tinea today. Oh, the number of people whose tinea has spread from the toes uh, to the fingernails. Uh, you know, the number of people, if we, you know, um, <clears throat> what we are seeing in Western Australia is a total optical illusion. Yeah. That if you can terrorise a population badly enough, they will support any measure that you offer them as a state leader. Yeah. yeah. And so Mark McGowan is experiencing levels of popularity which have never been experienced by an Australian politician before. And but but I just say um, the citizens. So so even though I give the citizens a bit of slack for the fact that governments and media have terrorised them. Yeah. I still say we're a bunch of suckers and we have fallen, you know, for the dope. Um, and we are in Western Australia is going to do itself immeasurable harm. Well, well and people, James, people will die. <clears throat> James's <laughs> comment here speaks exactly to that. We won't know the net benefit or or cost of the lockdowns for some years after the lockdowns are finished. And one example is here in James's comment, wait until the deaths from cancers caught at stage three instead of stage one kick in. Yeah. We know that this is a reality. We know that this is happening. People didn't get diagnoses for serious life-threatening medical conditions until much later than they could have as a result of all the lockdowns and all the restrictions. And this is this is the total cost that needs to be needs to be taken into account when we actually look at the effect of the lockdowns. You can't just look at the effect on COVID deaths. And we know that, that uh, according to UK data, only about 6% of, of COVID deaths are actually from COVID. The other 94% are with COVID and they had other things that were that were very much advanced in, in the yeah. process of killing them. And, and to be clear, and I, and I want to say this, and I want this on the record, I don't say that flippantly. I've lost two friends to COVID. One was 50, the other was 73. Neither of them had serious underlying health conditions that could have otherwise explained their death. I would consider both of them to have been killed by COVID. And, and certainly in the case of the 50-year-old, this was someone that we knew well, a lifelong friend of my wife. Her, uh, his, his widow and um, one of his children are living with my parents-in-law because they needed somewhere to go in order to try and recalibrate their life and figure out what life looks like. I mean, who expects their spouse to die at 50 years of age? No one does. So I'm not a COVID denier. I'm not denying the existence of this thing. I'm not denying that it does kill people, but we have to keep it in proportion. You know, one of the, one of the points that I make um, is that over, the, have a guess, Ross, and this is unfair because you've had no preparation, no warning. Have a guess. What is the total all-time road toll from automobiles in Australia? Since the invention of the automobile until today, how many people have been killed on the road in automobile accidents in Australia? Have a guess. Look, I would guess, um, let me think. Um, I would guess we lose... Thousand hundred something less than. I'm guessing we probably lose three and a half thousand people a year to road fatalities. But okay. I'm, 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 in, in the modern in the modern era, it's well below that. At, there was a time when that was fair, yeah. but in the modern era, it's well below that. But automobiles have been around for over a hundred years. Yeah, they're safer than they've ever been right now. Um, but actually, the total since the invention of the automobile, the total road toll in Australia is over two hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. So, now, how many for, years we say we've had? When was the first Holden rolled off the line? Let's say post. Okay, oh, the, first, the first Holden was post World War One. I'm not sure exactly when that would have been. Yeah, I'm thinking like, okay, keep going. So yeah, so you're saying so, the total is two hundred thousand. The total is over two hundred thousand. Now I've lost four friends to the road toll. Yeah. Two workmates and two church friends, um, and each of them died in in multiple fatality accidents. Uh, I've also lost a cousin to an off excuse me to an off road motorcycle accident. Now, my response to that tragedy was not 
to turn around and try and ban the automobile and yeah. say, no, we shouldn't have vehicles on the roads because sure. the collateral damage of that would be unimaginable. Can you imagine if we just took all vehicles off the road? No delivery vehicles, no trucks, no private cars, no nothing. We can end the road toll tomorrow. 200,000 Australians have died. We can put an end to this madness tomorrow. But the collateral damage, the cost would be unacceptable. It would be beyond yeah. what any of us can imagine if we were to do that to, to our world today. The benefit of automobiles actually outweighs the cost. And I say that as a human being who has felt the cost of the road toll at a very personal level. And the yeah. same is true of every disease, every virus, whether it's cancer, whether it's a communicable disease, a, a, a lifestyle disease, uh, whether it's diabetes, whether it's cancer, whether it's COVID-19, we actually have to weigh up the cost versus the benefit. And this is what I feel was never done with COVID-19. And, and you may disagree with me, with me Ross. I, I, I don't know exactly where you stand. But even from the very early days in 2020, from I would argue from March 2020, when we began to get some decent data on what COVID was and who it affected, we adopted policies that had a cost that exceeded the benefits. Look, the um, I think um, from day one, it didn't make sense. Um, if you did, when you talk about costs and benefits, you know, uh, you're, you're sort of singing my song. Uh, we're going back to Plato. Uh, we're going back to let's start with the maths. Just do the basic maths. And um, if we do the maths on what are the risks of exposure to an entire population to, to treat an experimental drug, Hmm. presents a lethal risk to a very, very tiny portion of the population. Uh, when the drugs have no whole of life study, yeah, uh, when they have been developed um, very, very quickly, and when they are using a brand new technology, uh, when we have no idea what is the impact of the drug on the baby of an injected mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which purpose the drug has not been approved, but which the baby cannot avoid. And there can be, uh, when they have not, not even been extensive animal testing among mammals, vertebrates. Um, it always looked to me like the scientific medical community had this shiny new toy that they were mm. testing to try out. Yeah. And they, felt that if they could create a sufficient sort of fear environment, uh, they might be given consent. And indeed, we have from, um, you know, somebody like Saul Alinsky, mm. who is a classic uh, Jewish genius, but unlike Jane Jacobs, is um, not on the good side. Um, you know, Saul tells us um, in... Uh, not just rules for radicals, but how to create a socialist society. His number one yeah. rule, his very first rule is take control of healthcare because if you can control a person's health, you can control their whole life. And so now we find uh, states who uh, have a motive to terrify their populations. Yeah. They have a media who are being paid to do the job and they are doing it very effectively very assiduously uh, they are absolutely obedient clients um, and we are taking a range of risks which i think again if you just do the maths um i don't believe the human race has been prepared to embrace this level of risk um at any time in yeah uh, in human history um, but it's such a low level of risk for most of the population. I completely accept that those above 70 certainly need to pay attention to COVID and, and need to potentially modify their behaviour and, and take action that would reduce their risk. I accept that from COVID. But we knew from March 2020, we knew the profile of this virus. We knew who it affected most. And to then lay the burden 
of the COVID response overwhelmingly on the young, those who are still in education, those who are in their early years of, of their jobs, early years of their careers, it seems to be very disproportionately laying the cost on those that don't actually face the risk from this virus. Well, I don't think, I mean, at the moment, we're all, um, I mean, we, we find in New South Wales, Don Perrottet sort of at, at least apparently had some flickering filament, uh, some synapse in his whole body, which is, uh, you know, is trying to hold these risks in tension. Yeah. Dealing with a medical establishment, which is completely insulated from all of the costs. Correct. Down. Correct. I look at one side, but not the other. Yeah. And and indeed, this is why you talked about your three sort of favourite people in the uh, in the climate change debate. Um, Matt Ridley and uh, I forget who the other two were. Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Longberg, Matt Ridley and Hans Rosling, the late Hans Ros Rosling. I cannot commend him highly enough. Look him up, Hans Rosling. Look him up on YouTube. His yeah. presentations are fantastic. I, I would add a fourth and probably a fifth. I, mean, I mean, I love Professor Ian Plymer. Um, yes. He, he probably drinks uh, too much red wine and he's had a pretty serious bout with count, cancer. I don't know how long uh, he's going to last. I mean, but a bastard like Graham Richardson has had five organs cut out, still keeps going every day and turning up to work. Uh, obviously, Graham Richardson should have an order in the Award of Australia. Um, <clears throat> but Ian Plymer, um, should should have another one, one of the, both Australian treasures, along with uh, Clive Palmer, who I love. Um, <clears throat> not, not everybody does, but I do. <laughs> um, but what um, the guy, uh, the, my elliptical path is to Alex Epps. That, that, that long <laughs> pathway around, yes. yes. <laughs> Alex Epstein, um, who is the good Epstein, um, a cl another classic kind of. I assume Epstein is a is is Jewish. Could be wrong, um, but he is really a modern philosopher, a relatively young man. He started out as a climate change believer, right. uh, but then just said, "Well, I'm going to have to go ahead and satisfy myself." Um, according to my own reasoning and data rather than just accepting some sort of dogma or liturgy. Um, and he said his problem was, as he studied the material, um, although he was not a scientist, um, he said he, he was a student of the rhetoric. And he said the first thing that he, that he recognised was two principles operating side by side. And the first principle was that you were allowed to discuss the benefits of um, renewable solutions, such as wind, solar, and allegedly battery. Um, you were allowed to discuss their benefits, but you were not allowed to discuss the defects and the costs. Yeah. So you could talk about all the terrific ways in which batteries were becoming cheaper and lasting longer, et cetera, but you couldn't talk about the acid that was, you know, no. inside them. And you couldn't just talk about how they were despised. And you, you could talk about... You couldn't talk about where the cobalt comes from and what's yeah. involved yeah. in that. Yeah. And yeah. he said, you know, he said, I noticed you could talk about <clears throat> the benefits of wind farms, but you mm -hmm. couldn't talk about all of the raptors, the hawks and the eagles and... Uh, the other birds of prey, which were piled up in a sort of a... To be uh, clear, uh, the endangered fire. birds that if yeah. you or I were responsible for killing them, we would be hauled yeah. in front of a court. Yeah. But they can be killed in fairly significant numbers by wind farms and no one's allowed to yeah. talk about yeah. it. And nobody knows because a wind farm is a kind of a temple uh, of the yeah. new religion. And so that was principle number one, is you could talk about the benefits, you couldn't talk about the harms. And then he said the second principle he noticed in the public discourse was you could talk about the risks and the costs of fossil fuels. Yes, but not the benefits. Uh, but you couldn't talk about any of the benefits. Yes. <laughs> but even though, you know, because of the calorific density of a um, block of uh, hard coking coal, yeah. means that you can build a 1,000-megawatt um, power station 
inside a uh, kind of like a one hectare block, which yeah. is generally going to generate enough power to feed a city of uh, four or five million people from one power station within a one hectare unit. Whereas because of the calorific uh, dispersion mm -hmm. inside of uh, wind uh, and solar, because the wind only blows, let's say, 22% of the time, or the sun only sure. shines 8% of the yep, time, yep, yep. Uh, that means you need 100 times the amount of geographical space mm -hmm. in order to deliver the mm -hmm. same commodity unit of 1,000 megawatts of energy. Yep. And because of the fact that we know, you know, what the engineers talk about, the problem of July, uh, where, for example, you know, in South Australia, uh, you can go for 10 days in which the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Mm -hmm. And what that means is there is no battery in the world that can get you through 10 days. Correct. Correct. You through, there's no battery that can get, you, can get a state municipal energy grid through 10 hours yeah. if the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Okay, if you yeah. want to go 10 days, you want to go two or three weeks. So what that means is you have to replicate the entire renewable infrastructure with a fossil fuel guaranteed base load mm -hmm. fast start mm -hmm. power alternative. Now, and what Alex Epstein said was, I noticed that I was allowed, everyone is allowed to talk about the impacts of fossil fuels on the carbon dioxide economy, but mm -hmm. nobody was allowed to talk about the benefits of fossil fuel. And so we said, well, so these two strata operating together, which completely sterilised rational debate and meant there was no conceivable way you could have a genuine scales of justice measuring the, the costs and benefits of East, he said, at that point, I flipped. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I find Alex Epstein a persuasive and I find exactly the same thing in the COVID debate, mm. that I don't come to the COVID debate with a kind of inflexible, you know, I don't start from belief that COVID doesn't exist. No, not at all. Me neither. I accept that those who wish to make, you know, that science has actually produced a series of tests about how we know what a disease is and how we know what its treatment is and how it's it must be re replicable and experiments must work in the same way. And, but I say to you, um, you know, these I don't accept a proposition which has been advanced by the medical establishment that this is a threat so great, so imminent, so new that a thousand years worth of consensus uh, must be suspended uh, mm -hmm. in, in order to deal with it and that no safety requirements may be imposed on manufacturers of new drugs and yeah. that all legal obligation to meet the cost of uh, vaccine related injury must be suspended yeah. uh, and that every uh, you know dark new experimental desire must be expressed and fulfilled and that any uh, ancient right to mobility or expression or employment mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. bodily autonomy must be immediately suspended and may not be returned, uh, I don't accept. I don't buy it. Uh, I think it's wrong. I think it's morally wrong. I think it's economically mm -hmm. destructive. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, if you say is Australia in decline, you know, COVID uh, is the most emphatic explanation mark of decline. All right. I'm mindful that we've we've passed three and a half hours, and uh, as much as I enjoy setting new records, um, I want to bring us on to what for me is the final subject that I wanted to to, to bring up with you, Ross. Uh, however, it's a slow chat, so if we keep on going, we keep on going. Um, you were an MP. Correct me if I'm wrong for the Liberal Party. Yeah, it wasn't for the Nationals. It was for the Liberals. Correct. Um, my understanding is that you have actually joined a different party to the Liberal yeah. Party. Can you explain to me what you've chosen to do and the reasons behind what you've chosen to do more recently? Yeah. Well, look, I think, Topher, that, you know, we, if, we, if, if we say the first question is, this has been a, a, quite a personal decision for me. I wouldn't necessarily urge, urge it on others. 
uh, but I'm sure. happy. It's, it's always a personal decision. If you invite me to, I'm happy to share, you know, my reasoning. And so yep. I accept that a state, I, I accept I'm in a citizen, I'm a citizen of a country which is in rapid, uh, almost terminal decline, will shortly reach a point from which it can't return. Okay. Um, but that I think there is one last chance um, to pull the rabbit out of the hat, to find the break before we reach the cliff, uh, to return. And before you continue, I'm yeah. fairly close to the same view. I mean, ultimately, I, I'm looking at the next election in Victoria. If yeah. Daniel Andrews gets returned as Premier, I'm out. I'm out of Victoria. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. And look, I'm frankly, um, you, you know, I, I, I'm living in this twilight zone, this strange world where I grew up absolutely loving my country, where I grew up as a kind of patriot, mm -hmm. uh, where I went into politics in part, whatever other selfish or venal motives, you know, in part because I loved the Australian idea. Uh, I loved what, you know, uh, 40,000 years of Aboriginal and 220 years of European settlement had produced. Mm. Uh, and I thought we could create a kind of paradise. I thought we yeah. could create a nation as great as the Minoans, uh, as beautiful as the uh, Athenian Golden Age, um, as evocative as the European uh, Renaissance. I thought we had it all as the only country in the world with a whole continent to ourselves yep. and that continent having these abundant natural resources and an open, friendly, tolerant, well-educated, innovative population. I thought, wow, this yep. maybe can go. I'm, I'm with you. I'm, uh, at this point, I'm 100% with you. What yep. happened? And, and yet what we found is we gave up our Australianness and plugged the cable into Brussels and Paris and Kyoto and um, became this sort of generic uh, global product, which in rubbing off and destroying all of the distinctive, wonderful, laconic, laid-back, friendly, under-regulated, you know, Australian qualities, Mm -hmm. uh, and we have sought to sterilise our own resource base and walk yeah. away from our inheritance uh, as a nation. So my view is I've joined the Liberal Democratic Party. Okay. Um, it may or may not run in the election as the Liberal Democratic Party because the government... Well, there's that challenge against their name, isn't there? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Ruddick, Ruddick versus the Commonwealth. Uh, the New South Wales number one Senate candidate, John Ruddick, author mm. of the book, ironically, Make the Liberal Party Great Again. <laughs> liberal, I wasn't aware of that. That's hilarious. As, yeah, as a long-term <laughs> liberal, John Ruddick wrote the book where he compared five different uh, democracies and compared their constitutional arrangements of their major political parties. Mm -hmm. And he argued that the Liberal Party's got to move away from faction-based, small franchise, insider, boss backroom deals to plebiscite primary-style constitutional arrangements to break the yeah. power of faction bosses. Yeah. And he tried and he tried and he tried. And now we've just seen he largely succeeded. Yeah. Uh, in reforming the New South Wales division, but we now see the Prime Minister and Alex Hawke are uh, stepping in uh, because they wish to protect incumbents. They wish to avoid exposing them to competition. They call themselves a Liberal Party, but they are the most authoritarian, faction-based, anti-Liberal organisation. So, and then the next thing they did was to say to the Liberal Democrats, who have been Liberal Democrats, have owned that name for over 20 years, they've saying you can't run as Liberal Democrats uh, because people might get confused and actually want to vote for our busted-ass, uh, corrupt uh, backwater <laughs> of... Uh, you know, former democratic values. Um, so that's in the High Court at the moment. The High Court's going to make a decision on yeah. like, it's the 14th or 15th uh, of this month. But the party is considering whether it's whether Scott Morrison has made the word liberal so toxic mm. to the Australian voter that it mm. may be in their interests to change their name to Liberty Democratic Party 
just to yeah. distinguish themselves uh, from yeah. the sewer of Alex Hawke and Scott Morrison and Trent Zimmerman and the factional bosses who desperately wish to avoid pre-selection. The Liberal Party in New South Wales, which has 50 seats and they still don't have candidates three months from an election because the faction bosses can't it's do amazing. It's so pathetic. It's amazing. Uh, can, can, putting can, can I, putting can, that to one side. I'm can you sorry. hold that thought? Can you yeah. hold that thought right where you are, thinking about yeah. where you were about to go so that we don't yeah. lose our place? Okay. Let me give you an anecdote that illustrates how deep the rot is within the Liberal Party. I was invited to speak. This is in my early days as Topher. I'd published only a few videos. I was asked to speak at a Victorian Liberal Party branch meeting somewhere up in, in the Dandenong Ranges here in Victoria. And what I, I, what I said to the guy who invited me, I said, listen, I'm happy to come and speak, but you're not going to like what I've got to say to the Liberal Party of Victoria. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm going to like it. The other people in the room may not but I know where you're coming from and I'm going to like it. I said, all right, fine. You know yeah. what you got yourself into, right? Yeah. So I came and what I did was I, I had a copy of Robert Menzies' speech when he founded the Liberal Party of Australia. Yes. And he lays out in that speech what they are for and what they are against. Mm. And I read that speech in its entirety. And I then simply posed a question. I said, if you were to put the, the policies of the Liberal Party of Victoria to a person who knew nothing, would they think that these were the policies of the party that Robert Menzies was opposed to or the party that Robert Menzies founded? Yes. And then I sat down. Yeah. <laughs> and for some very strange reason, no one wanted to talk to me afterwards. No. <laughs> Um, they have strayed a very long way from their roots. Yes. Um, there is a guy whose name uh, will come to me. One of your audience will be able to provide it, I'm sure. Um, who, in fact, just re, um, reproduced the doctrine of the Stoics mm. uh, in a book called, I'm pretty sure it was called The Power of Now. And okay. he's book was picked up by Oprah Winfrey's book club and became a global bestseller. And um, he, um, it's got a Scandinavian name. I think it might be Swedish. Anyway, it, it, it'll come to me. But um, his argument, uh, he, he, he became very, very um, influential with this idea which he discovered on a park bench um, in a moment of clarity and revelation. Mm -hmm. And his idea was the only uh, moment that you can live in is this exact moment. Right. And we spend lots of our lives worrying about what's happened in the past, although we can't change it. And we spend a lot of anxiety about what might or might not happen uh, uh, Eckhart Toll is Eckhart the name Toll. coming Eckhart yeah, from, from multiple viewers. Thank you to everyone yeah. that's posted that. There's quite a few uh -huh. of you. Well, it's lovely people are even still listening. Um, yeah. Um, well, look, well, we've got a couple of hundred people still watching and there's going to be yeah. thousands that are going to watch it afterwards. And, and yeah. can I just say, I, I appreciate so much my viewers. You guys are here at a quarter to midnight on a Thursday night and you're still engaged. You're still watching. You're commenting. You're listening. You're answering our questions. Thank you. Ross, amen, continue. Amen, amen. So we've got Eckhart Tolle, and who's basically doing nothing but restating uh, Marx Aurelius, but doing it in a very, very nice way. Uh, again, yeah. a homeschooled guy, Eckhart Tolle's homeschooled parents. Okay. Said, there you go. Father. His father said, he said to his father, I don't want to go to school. His father said, okay, but I still expect you to learn. Yeah, of course. So he said, okay, I'm up for it. He studied languages. He mastered about five languages. And... Um, but he was actually doing sleeping on a park bench when he had this revelation, I'm pretty sure in England. It changed his life and he wrote about it. And But the point, what happened was after he became this massive celebrity, a lot of people came to him and said, well, Eckhart, are you going to set up some sort of an institute, you know, uh, some sort of an ashram, some sort mm. of an Eckhart Toll, a power of now university? <laughs> I remember he made this very interesting observation uh, where he said, you know, that institutions over time have this tendency to turn in on themselves and instead of serving 
the people they were created for, they 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 tend to then start to serve themselves and to sure. seek to to look after, to fulfil, to satiate, to um, you know sandbag their own interests. And he said, for that reason, uh, he was not planning to. Um, you know, and this is what we've seen with the Liberal Party, that it started out. Indeed, the Liberal, the antecedent of the Liberal Party is the United Australia Party. And this is where yeah. Clive Palmer and Craig Kelly and their uh, team have made a smart strategic move. And they're sort of saying, well, we want to take the legacy of sort of George Reid going right back uh, and we wish to restore the connection between the party and the Australian people. Now, yeah. even though I am, I have joined the Liberal Democratic Party, which philosophically, when the Liberal Democratic Party who are in the UK, who are a different organisation and who have drifted into a globalist sort of blamange, but their tradition is when a new party is elected, they give the new leader, this book on liberty <laughs> by John Stuart Mill. Now, no. I don't believe the new leader ever reads the fucking book, you know, but <laughs> that is the book they give him. And uh, so because I identify with that Edmund Burke John, to John Stuart Mill spectrum, that's really yep. my, my sort of natural place. You can put in yep. sort of... Ditto, um, ditto. Socrates to um, Plutarch to... Um, you know, uh, to Moses, Abraham, um, uh, Deborah, uh, you know, we might go back further to yeah. um, the Sumerians uh, and the Arcadians. Uh, but let's say I put myself in that tradition. Um, I just think the Liberal Party is, has, is an expression of Eckhart Tolle's observation that over time uh, it has turned in on itself and it now just serves the faction bosses, yeah. it serves the staffers, yeah. it serves the public sector, it serves the lobbyists, it doesn't serve the members of the Liberal Party who are mm. actually quite rational and quite conservative. It certainly doesn't serve the Australian people. It has reached the point where it needs to be given a dignified burial. <laughs> uh, so I say yeah. vote one, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party. Yeah. Uh, I have an immense respect for the United Australia Party and also, indeed, for Pauline Hanson's One Nation. So if you're anywhere in that mix, oh. say, God bless you, go well. Well, this is this is the key message that I'm trying to get out between now and the federal election, which is going to come up sometime by the end of May, and then, of course, the Victorian state election, which is happening in November of 2022. We need to be putting every single freedom-friendly party first, and all of the major parties last. This is this is the thing. Don't vote for one minor party and then put your favourite of the major parties second on your list. Put all of the freedom-friendly minor parties. I have deep uh, policy disagreements with UAP, with One Nation, with IMOP, A1, um, GAP, all of them, right? I have deep policy. I happen so full disclosure. I actually, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of this until just the other day, Ross. But um, you, you're, you've said that you're a member of the of the um, Liberal Democrats. I'm a financial member of the Liberal Democrats as well. I signed up just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So for me, they are the most intellectually consistent of all of them. Um, however, I will be voting one Liberal Democrats, two UAP, three One Nation. And then I'll be looking at the ticket to go, who else is there? Mm. Has A1 managed to get a, a candidate? Now, my understanding is at the moment, A1 are not likely to actually be on the ballot. Mm. Uh, they're not likely to, to cross the threshold to get registered. So uh, if they do, great. I'll put them there. If they don't, whatever. Uh, IMOP, GAP, whoever else is there, I'm going to put all of those people before I put the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, the Greens, the Nationals, anybody else. Mm. And this is the crucial thing with this upcoming election. Don't pick one of the minor freedom-friendly parties. Pick mm. all of them. Put mm. all of them. Number all of them. One, two, three, four, five, whatever. However many candidates you've got in the lower house and the upper house, put all of them first. Mm. Because that's how we can potentially, and it's not guaranteed, but that's how we can potentially send a shockwave through politics in Australia yeah. uh, is by enough people doing that. Well, look, there is um, one example. Um, 
you know, there, there, there are examples. My, my sense, if, if we're being, you know, if, if we're big enough and tough enough and adult enough to deal with reality, yeah, uh, we would probably say that it looks like Australia is rooted. Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, yes, I'm not willing to give up yet. Yeah. However, I think I think that we are in the minority chance of yeah. bringing Look, it back. I, I say there's still. I am. I've got a very very good friend, a former significant figure in Australian media, who's moved somewhere else in Asia, and he just says, "Look, um, Australia's got no future, and yeah. you yeah. are weak because of your refusal." to recognise that fact. But if the alternative to Morrison is Albanese, <laughs> then, then Australia has no future. And yeah. you should be honest enough and tough enough uh, to admit that and uh, move on emotionally, even if you can find some sinecure or racket to, to stay in as the thing implodes. Yeah. Uh, don't pretend that you, you belong to a self-respecting country because you don't. Yeah. No, uh, agreed. The, 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 you know, the, the, my idea is I am like you. I'm sort of here tonight because I haven't yet uh, given up. And I think, you know, if we could return to reason, there is a rapid path out of the bog and the swamp uh, that we have created. Um, but I think if the, if what I think of as the rational centre right, which is LDP, UAP, Pauline Hanson's One Nation, each of which has their distinctive recommendations and you might say flaws. Um, Agreed, uh, yep. Each of which, in my opinion, is an obvious net benefit. If you still believe Australia has a future, okay, if you have just accepted... <clears throat> that Australia has no distinctive qualities uh, that separate it from any other, you know, uh, sort of European extracted, uh, uh, UN uh, governed um, bureaucratic um, state. Yeah. Then if you believe that the human being is the problem and that it's a good thing that the population has is collapsing and that uh, Australians don't like each other enough to, have, uh, to reproduce, then... It's all good, you know, and that is, in effect, the Morrison, uh, Adam Bant, uh, Albanese view that Australia's decline is a good thing, that you shouldn't resist, uh, that you, the Gladys Berejiklian rush to, you know, increase the abortion rate, increase the euthanasia rate, increase yeah. in effect, uh, through COVID, the suicide rate, all of which uh, is, is, is their actual policy. If you still believe the country has a future and, and can grow, then I say we are aiming, we are trying to achieve a balance of power in the Senate at this election. Like I would go further. I would yep. go further. I actually think we have a genuine shot at a balance of power in the lower house. Yeah. Now, that's a big call, and I could end up with a lot of egg on my face, but I'm willing to put my name to that call. In well, Victoria, I, in Victoria, yeah, we have polls showing a 30% uh, th that 30% of voters have already decided that they will not vote for Liberal, Labor, Nationals or Greens. Mm. Now, if that's true, and polls are showing that it's true, if that's true, then we have a chance in Victoria to steal a handful of lower house seats. And if that's replicated across Australia, I think the balance of power in the lower house is not out of the question. Mm. Now, I may come to regret making that statement, but as things stand at this instant in time, that is how things appear. And I'm going to be releasing a video this coming week on how preferential voting works and how it is that 30% of the votes can actually translate to winning lower house seats. Well, um, Taifa, I respect that. You're now, you're on the line, you know. Yeah, you, very you, much so. Yep. You, um, and secretly... I agree with you. I am. Um, it's it, it's secret between you, me, and the couple of hundred people that are watching right now. Purely secret. Yep. And but frankly, if we are talking about you know the flaws and merits of the various so-called minor parties, um, 
it's one of the reasons why I have to respect the United Australia Party. Sure. I mean, I respect Paul Enhance's One Nation because I respect Paul Enhance. I, I do too. Uh, and For the I record, respect, I do too. I'm happy to go on the record. Yep. Malcolm Roberts. Yes, and very Paul much so. Very much so. He's one of the highest value members of Parliament we've seen in the yep. last 10 decades. Um, so I say, okay. Those two personnel, I mean, it was Pauline Hanson who moved the motion in the Senate uh, to block vaccine mandates and virtually yeah. the entire uh, Liberal and National parties voted against her. Almost. There were a few that crossed the floor, but only a very few. Yeah, and we should acknowledge um, the ones who did. And we recognise Senator um, Alex Antic, I think. Uh, yes. I think there was... Um, who is the LNP senator from the Northern Territory? Uh, there's a woman up there who also crossed. I think Senator Connor, Connie Fioravanti Wells crossed. Okay. Um, I, I don't recall specifically, but yeah. I'll take your word for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to admit that One Nation was doing uh, the heavy lifting uh, on, on that occasion. I think Rex Patrick um, mm -hmm. phoned yeah, here we go. Uh, Rosella says uh, Fia Verenti Wells crossed the floor as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing that I respect, I have to respect as a Plato Academy do the maths guy, um, is that Craig Kelly could would win without question if he mm -hmm. ran as the number one on the UAP Senate for New South Wales. On the Senate, he would be a shoe in Absolutely. Okay, but he's not running for the Senate. Uh, he's running for Hughes. He's running for the lower house. It, it, that's right. He's running the lower house in a seat in which uh, lots and lots of hardened political professionals have said that he can't win. I think people are beginning to reassess that assumption, but I, I've, I haven't gone and had a look at whether Betfair is running a book or sports bet on the seat of Hughes, but... Uh, most political professionals on both sides, Liberal and Labor, have had the view that Craig could not win Kelly, uh, could could not win Hughes as an independent. But yet he's running for Hughes, so he's taking on yep. that risk. And if you say to Craig Kelly, well, why are you doing that when you're a walk-up start for Senate position if you were to run number one? He says, well, I'm running for Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so a lot of people, one of the things that has shocked me a little bit in the last little while, and I don't mean this to be in any way condescending, um, but people are asking me questions that are very, very fundamental to how our government works. And it's been quite surprising. And it seems to me that our education system is failing in the area of civics as well as so many others. It's a bit so, technical, to be honest, but yeah, well, I take Point. I agree. So the government is formed by whichever party has a majority in the lower house. Now, in the yeah. federal election, that means the House of Representatives. The prime minister must be elected in the House of Reps. They yeah. cannot be a senator. Yeah. So that's that would be the significance of Craig Kelly choosing yeah. to run in the lower house as opposed to the upper house. Yeah. And, you know, what we have is I was having a chat actually to um, a bloke named... Uh, Andrew Robertson, who okay. is the UAP candidate for Warringah. Uh, Zali Stegall is the incumbent. Tony Abbott is, you know, yep. suffered the humiliation of, um, of, of losing that seat. Uh, the Liberals are in a state of internal um, absolute chaos. Uh, yes, they are. Their preferred candidate, a sort of uh, Zali Stegall clone, uh, has just withdrawn on the basis that they've delayed the pre-selection so long and the factional games have been so intense that she doesn't think she has time to win the seat. So, Okay, she, I've got to pause you again. I have no issue with A1, Gerard, um, but my understanding is that they're actually not going to be uh, registered for the election. I may be proven wrong. I hope to be proven wrong. I'd love to have them in there along with everybody else. I have no issue with A1, but my understanding is at this point in time, they are not going to be registered for the federal election. That's my understanding. Sorry, continue. Yeah, and and to be fair to the other minor parties, and, and I confess to you that, you know, it is a bit unfair of me to just pick out the, 
what I regard as the top three minor parties being yep. Liberal Democrats, Pauline Hanson's One Nation, United Australia Party. Which, accept, which, happened to, which happened to match my top three, by the way. Right. I'm the same. I, I, I accept there are other people who have done who have done and are doing terrific work at organising and mobilising sentiment. And I don't wish to disrespect that work in any way. Agreed. And I accept that, in fact, it is actually the so-called micro-parties, the brand-new kids on the block, who may well determine the result in a range of seats. So I don't... Mm, I don't may well, yes. ...misunderstood there. But I say to you, I respect the fact... I mean, Australia's probably got, you know... I don't know how many billionaires we've got in the country. We've got at least a dozen, but we might have 20. Yeah. Uh, there's only one of them who's put his hand up and said, look, I think Australia's future politically is important enough for me to invest a chunk of my fortune yeah. in achieving a rational centre-right balance of power, as Clive Palmer says explicitly, in both houses. So you and... Topher and Clive agree. Yeah. Okay. And, and, um, and let me say this. I think Clive Palmer's strategy was really misguided for the last couple of elections. Here in Melbourne, I'm driving along. I'm in Hawthorne. I'm driving down Glen Ferry Road, and I see a massive yellow and black sign with Clive Palmer's face on it yeah. saying to vote for the UAP. And yeah. I know, because I know the people of Hawthorne, I know the people of inner city Melbourne, I lived in Fitzroy for four years. You've drunk your share of lattes. That I've you drunk my share beard, of lattes. You've had your beard, your moustache. And I, and, I, uh, am, I am not ashamed of my latte addiction. Actually, it's a magic. If you, if you have to know, it's a magic. Yeah. Um, but looking at that sign, that yeah. sign earned him precisely zero votes. Okay, well, right. I'm going to take you on. Go. I watched, I forget, who is there? There is a guy who is Channel 9's chief political correspondent. He's married to, I think he's married to a Labor member of Parliament in Canberra. He's got a Catholic background. He occasionally says something rational about climate. Um one of your viewers will be able to tell us his name. I can't remember everybody's name at this time of night after, you know, <laughs> I forget how much scotch I've drunk. Um, <laughs> he said, well, uh, after the last election, the ScoMo surprise result, he said that, uh, well, Clive Palmer's just wasted 80 million bucks uh, because mm. he hasn't won a single seat. Sure. And I thought, well, this is the dumbest uh, contribution of a so-called political expert, you know, I've heard since Peter Van Onsen. And <laughs> he said, um, when what you have to understand, okay, notwithstanding your your reaction in the heart of uh, Melbourne Latte Land, is that Clive Palmer, let's assume Clive is worth, Eight billion. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, no idea. Yeah. I don't have a question, but let's pick a rough number. People say to me, you know, that a number of his royalty relationships with Citic and the Chinese are generating kind of like a hundred million bucks a month, something like that. I, I don't know yep. what the number is. Okay. Yep. But what I'm saying to you is if we assume he's around eight billion, he spent eighty million. So he said, okay, I'm going to wager 1% of my fortune. Yep. And every single ad that he ran depressed Labor's primary vote. Hmm. Even if the vote didn't come to him, it meant that Shorten was going to the election as an unbackable favourite. Nobody thought ScoMo could win. Yep. I've spent 1% of his fortune, and I believe that 1%. Every single ad held Labor's primary vote underwater. Yeah. As they approached the election when they had to lift, they faced an $80 million wall of messaging. Yeah. In which Clive Palmer wrote every single word of every ad. Yeah. And surprise, surprise, on the night, you know, Penny Wong and Tanya Plibersek. Glum-faced, 
you know, all of them trying to find the words, Tony Burke, Bill Shorten wouldn't, you know, uh, you know, all saying, oh, well, it's still early. There's some uncertainty. We're waiting for the booze in the outer suburbs to come in. <laughs> you know, uh, Clive Palmer spent 1% of his fortune to flip an election. Yeah. He's the smartest and, and, in the country. And, and that may very well be true. Right, I, I, I'm not going to gainsay that. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong because that may very well be true. Um, and and one of the things with this upcoming election, so so my focus, and you're going to see this for those of you that follow me, if you're watching and you, and you follow me, um, you're going to see me talking a lot about preferential voting, how it works, why we need to be voting for all of the minor parties before we vote for any of the major parties. I've, I've bought a thousand marbles. I've got nine tubs with a thousand marbles distributed between them. There is a video sitting on my, my table inside ready for me to film when I finally have the energy to film it in between all my other media commitments. So I will get to that probably in this coming week. But there is a very real uh, politi there's a political reality that not everybody runs to win. If you're the second, third or fourth candidate on, for example, the Liberal Democrats ticket, you're not there because you're thinking you're going to win your seat. There are six Senate seats per state. If you're number four, you're not going to win. If you're number three of a minor party, you're not going to win. If you're number two of a minor party, you're probably not going to win. You're there to amplify the, the 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 messaging, the voice, to increase the odds of that number one candidate getting in. Clive Palmer, as much as, like, look, I hesitate. I really do. I don't know how, what to make of Clive Palmer. I'm in complete honesty. I don't know what to make of him. My brother has met him. He he did a road trip around Australia, happened to bump into Clive Palmer, literally standing at the side of a local rugby match up in Queensland somewhere, right? Just yeah. literally bumped into him, had a chat, took a photograph. Uh, I don't know what to make of Clive Palmer. I don't. But the idea that Clive Palmer spent $80 million because he thought he was going to win the election, no, that's nonsense. Clive Palmer never thought that he was going to win the election or whatever. That's pure fantasy, and Clive Palmer would never have bought into that. He was simply trying to nudge the result in the direction that he believed was best for it to go in. And there, we, we need to take a similar, similar approach. Uh, personally, I'm a member of the Liberal Democrats. Do I think a Liberal Democrat is going to be the Prime Minister at this election? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. It's pure fantasy to think that that would happen. But do I think that we can get the LDP into the balance of power in the Senate? Maybe. Do I think that we can get the LDP and or One Nation and or UAP into the balance of power in the lower house? That's hard. But you know what? If we focus and if we work and if we actually do the work on the ground, I actually think it's possible in this election. It's not always about winning. Sometimes it's about limiting the power of the person who does win in the end, making sure that they have to negotiate with you in order to become the prime minister in the first place. If you can put yourself in that position, well, now you're the tail that can wag the dog. Yeah. Topher, I, um, I have concluded you're a very smart guy. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the um, realism, you know, is what we're after. Yeah. Uh, objectivity, it's, it's a difficult challenge. I mean, Plutarch says that managing your anger is, is the hardest challenge. Yeah. Um, but objectivity is, um, is an immensely uh, to be respected uh, quality in a person um, who is indicating they have to attain the degree of self-mastery where they are um, able to isolate the influence of their interests from the actual data which is coming across the desk. And Graham Richardson would call it, you know, somebody who knows how to count. Um, <laughs> yeah. What um, we are talking about is I agree with you, okay, that... Okay. I think it is Clive Palmer and Craig Kelly will tell you 
I mean, the UAP is running a candidate in every seat in the House of Representatives. Yes. 151 seats. Okay. Um, and uh, each of those candidates is going to go into the final 33-day campaign yep. uh, with a budget, you know, to spend some money um, and because at least they have an average of over 500 members in every lower house seat in Australia. Which is phenomenal. They had a campaign launch for the UAP candidate, Andrew Robertson, who is sort of like a 31-year-old lawyer who's just had, you know, married, just had a second child, who is a smart, articulate young guy with a good job who said, I just can't believe uh, the loss of the freedoms which we have suffered and I don't want my children to inherit such a deficit. And so he's running as a candidate in Warringah yep. against Zali Stegall. He yeah, had right. nearly 200 people turn up to his campaign launch. Yeah, wow. We were drawn from within Warringah. Yeah, wow. Okay, to get 200 people into a political meeting, let alone for one candidate in one seat, yeah. I'm telling you, this has got some legs. Yeah. When I look at the Liberal Democratic Party, you've got Campbell Newman, a former Premier of Queensland. Yes. He's done a very, very good job running a family business with, you know, kind of managing a couple of hundred million dollars worth of assets. Mm -hmm. He's been Rag back in because he just says, I can't bear what I'm seeing. A former mm -hmm. premier with really nothing to prove to gain, he's running. Uh, you've got John Ruddick, a former long term yes. Liberals, number one LDP Senate candidate for New South Wales. And, and future slow chat guest, may I say. Good. You'll enjoy John. John is a yeah. very originally born in Tamworth. Yeah, got a rustic sort of quality, but he's a seriously smart guy and a yeah. stupid. There's no one in us, virtually no one in Australia who knows more about US presidential elections than John Ruddick. Yeah, he's wow. actually wrote the book on the reform of the Liberal Party, but eventually the factions crushed the reform. He's the yeah. number one Senate candidate for the LDP in New South Wales. Yeah, and then you go down to Victoria and you've got David Limbrick. And who Limbrick. has been okay, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. Yeah, he has been a trooper yeah. through the darkest days that the Victorian state has ever faced. Yeah. David Limbrick and Tim Quilty. Now, Tim Quilty is more regional, he's up in the north. So he's been like David Limbrick's voice has been has been, I think, amplified more because he represents a more metropolitan area. So it's a little bit yeah. unfair. But David Limbrick and Tim Quilty have been the voices of reason through all of this insanity. Mm. And I think running David Limbrick as the number one Senate candidate for Victoria for the federal election was an absolute freaking stroke of genius. Well, thank I you. I 100% support him. Thank you. And, you know, one of the reasons why I respect uh, Quilty and Limbrick, so as mm. you say, for those who may be learning Australian civics or just arrived in Australia, they were members and of the new South, of the Victorian Legislative Council, state the, uh, Victorian state uh, government. Yes, and so Quilt, uh, Quilty will remain there, but David Limbrick is going to run as the Liberal Democratic uh, candidate for the Victorian Senate, and uh, he's got an absolutely magnificent you know, crystal. He's number two, who's a yes. former Victorian police officer. Yes. Who, uh, smart, articulate, courageous, and also, in my opinion, beautiful. Um, <laughs> I, look, is, I'm, I'm, I am married to a beautiful blonde, so I have yeah. to be careful what I say, but yeah. I'm not going to disagree with you. No. Um, but she's beautiful in a sense because she loves Victoria, you know. She yeah, loves yeah, her country. Yeah, she she, she loved does. being a police officer, but she had to resign because she said, I can't morally support police officers standing over citizens to force them uh, to do things which are, uh, mo you know, morally wrong. Yeah. But the point about Limbrick um, and Quilty is that even though they were both vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, Dan Andrews, passed a motion demanding 
that they hand over their medical records to prove their vaccination status in order to be eligible to enter the parliament. And Quilty and Limerick said, well, look, even though we're both vaccinated, we stand with all Victorians, whether they are vaccinated or not, that they yeah. deserve a right to medical privacy. And so we are not going to hand over our records to Daniel Andrews as individuals, yeah. our patient yeah. records, which are sacred between the privacy of the doctor and the patient. And then the Liberal Party voted with the Labor Party to say, unless you two hand over your private medical records, you're not allowed in to do your job. Well, I say, you know, Just ridiculous. they can go to hell. You know, yes. they deserve to burn it. That's ridiculous. Um, it, and Limbrick is a hero. Yes, Limbrick I agree. is the one who was prepared to stand up with those who were without a voice, even though he was a privilege, he could have gone in. Uh, yep. He chose to stand with the marginalised and the outsiders and with the principal, and he deserves yep. to be elected a senator for Victoria. Okay. We need him in the federal Senate. And what happens then, because he's vacating a Victorian Senate seat, the way the upper house works in, sorry, not Victorian Senate, Victorian upper house, the way the Victorian upper house works, the Liberal Democratic Party will be able to replace him with another uh, nominee of theirs. So mm. we're not losing a Victorian Liberal Democratic uh, upper house member. They will be replaced by somebody else. Uh, I, I don't know who that would be. It might be the number two Senate candidate, uh, Crystal Mitchell. It might be someone else. I literally have no idea. Have you had um, Crystal on slow chat? I've not had Crystal yet. I've, I've, I've had a look. I've, I've discussed things with her. I've done some lives with her and that sort of thing. I've got a lot of time for her. She's in my documentary, Battleground Melbourne. I have immense respect for Crystal. She's like the old Australian girl, you know. Yeah, she is. Going Absolutely. For all the right reasons and left mm. the Victorian police force for all the right reasons. Is going to politics for all the right reasons. I'd love to see them both get elected. Look, that would be nice. And if if the polls are correct in saying that 30% of Victorian voters have already abandoned Labor, Liberal, Greens and Nationals and are going to vote for somebody else. And in addition to that 30%, by the way, there's another 10% on top that are undecided. If we can get 32%, 33%, 34% to vote for the freedom-friendly minor parties and vote for all of the freedom friendly minor parties before voting for anybody else mm. then we could genuinely see two probably not three that's probably a pipe dream but we could see two senators elected from Victoria to the federal parliament to the federal senate that are freedom friendly and that would be absolutely freaking amazing the shock wave that that would send through politics mm. and the shock wave that that would send because I, I live in victoria right i live under daniel andrews and the victorian labor party the shock wave that that would send through the victorian labor party to watch that happen at a federal level and then all of those backbenchers and all of those um, uh, the cabinet members in Victoria who are sitting on less than about a 10% margin are going to be sitting there going, oh, fuck. The pressure that would be on Daniel Andrews as a result of that election result would be freaking amazing. Well, look, John Ruddick's book, um, Make the Liberal Party Great Again, mm. Um, where he was really saying, look, I don't want to leave. It was like Martin Luther, who did not want to leave the Catholic Church. Um, sure. But in the end, he said, look, if you guys want to continue with the indulgences uh, and with the corruption um, and with the sort of preference for the institution over the mission, uh, then I'm out. And yeah. that's, in the end, what happened to Raddick. But he mentions the uh, Canadian case study where there was a political party. I'm pretty sure it was the Canadian Reform Party. It might have been the Liberal Reform Party. And they started out very much like the Liberal Democrats, like this sort of revolt on the right which is taking place. And in the first election, they gained the balance of power, you know, in the upper house in Canada. In yeah, the second yeah, election, they gained a smattering of seats in the lower house. Sure. And the record of focus and, and citizen orientation, rather than serving the interests of the state, that they would serve the interests of the citizen. And then by the third election, they formed a government. 
And this, I believe, when people say to me, Ross, you know, why don't you just accept it's over, that the Western story <laughs> is finished, uh, that you, yeah. you, you should just bury your hopes and dreams. Um, there is, I think, this last chance, what Paul Keating called the last shot in the locker. Yeah. Um, if we can gain, if a combination of the Liberal Democrats, the United Australia Party, uh, Paul and Hanson's One Nation, yeah. with the support of the uh, principled and motivated micro parties who are uh, running with different levels of strength in different states around the country, um, if we can win the balance of power in the Senate, you see, because the point is in the last Senate quote, if there's six senators voted for in each state, very yeah. often the last quote is is the you, you don't need, you know, sixteen percent to no, win. It, it's about it's about seven and a half, eight yeah. percent. That's all you need. And in truth, people have won the last quota with even much less than seven so, and a half. On, on occasion, yes. And I have the feeling that the way in when ScoMo turns around to his base and uh, and genuflects uh, to um, Paris to give a billion dollars, another billion to the Great Barrier Reef, yeah. when, when every Uber driver and, you know, restaurant worker and musician and a small business person knows how hard it is to make one dollar and he gives yeah. away a billion like that yeah. for a non-problem, yeah. I have the feeling that the traditional rusted on unthinking liberal vote could just implode yep. and we could see a kind of landslide, a kind of avalanche, a kind of tsunami uh, yep. in the last weeks of the campaign oh. against both liberal and labor. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, so I'm 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 backing in the Topher Field thesis, <laughs> and I reckon there is a decent chance we could see a rational centre centre right conservative libertarian balance of power when nobody wants to vote for I nobody wanted to vote for Bill Short, and that was one of the reasons no. why this game no. I got in. In my heart, I don't really think anybody wants to vote for Albo. No. Uh, no. And so you've got a situation where you've got these magnets which are pushing votes away from both yep. Liberal and Labor. A yep. lot of people are saying, where do we go? I yep. think we could see a minor party, centre-right, rational coalition of Liberal Democrats, One Nation and United Australia Party holding yep. the balance of power in both the Senate yep. and the House of Representatives. And can I just say, thank God for our preferential voting system. In the American system where you vote one for somebody and then your vote counts for nothing after that, uh, that is why the Democrat and Republicans in the US have a lock on the American political system. In Australia, we have a preferential voting system. You vote number one for the person you like best. You vote number two for the person you like next best and three and four and five and six and seven and however many lower house candidates or upper house candidates if we're, if we're talking upper house you your preferential vote the the power of the preferential vote is that you can vote boldly for the person that you would actually like knowing that your vote is not wasted in the american system where it's just one and done you if you vote for that third party well if that third party doesn't get enough then your vote was wasted it doesn't happen here in australia and this is my task I, as i view it as a political communicator as a political commentator, um, my task over the next four months is to educate the Victorian and the Australian public on the power of preferential voting so that they can put number one, whoever they, they like best. In my case, it's going to be the Liberal Democrats. Number two, whoever they like second best. In my case, it's going to be UAP. Number three, whoever they like next. In my case, it's going to be One Nation. Number four, it's going to be A1 or IMOP or, or GAP or whoever gets a candidate in, in that seat. I'm going to keep voting down that list. And at the very bottom, the bottom three positions, all I can tell you with certainty is number one is going to be Liberal Democrats. And the very bottom three positions are going to be made up of the Liberal, Labor and Greens parties. That's all I can tell you with certainty. Whatever happens in between, whatever, doesn't matter. I'm going to put them all in between. 
And I've got a video coming out this coming week that is going to explain why that is so important and why if enough of us do exactly that, we vote number one for the one we like best, we vote for all the other ones that maybe we don't like as much, but but they're better. And then we put all the major parties, all the established parties at the very end. Why that is so powerful. I've got a video coming out in this coming week that is going to explain all of that. Ross, are there any final thoughts, final whatever that you want to leave us with before I wind up for tonight? Well, look, I guess the last thing, um, you know, I, I would say is I respect um, the product that you have produced, the story you have told about Melbourne. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I'm a little bit of a amateur, complete rank amateur. I'm not a scholar of any kind, but a little bit of a student of the storytellers going back to Aesop's fables, you know, one of the seven sages of Greece. Mm. Um, I love the fact that the spirit of your enterprise is letting Victorians tell their own story. Yes. Uh, letting Australians tell their own story. And there is a sense in which Topher Field has not sought to kind of uh, coerce, molest, control this story, but you have sought it's, to simply provide the platform. It's the not my story. It's story. not my story. I, I was the, a part of it. I was a yeah. part of it, but I was only one part of yeah. a very big story. Um, and I want to say that that spirit of allowing people to tell their own story. You know, th this is this is really, um, you know, this is gold. This is at the absolute heart and core of what we are seeking to promote. You and I may, in good conscience, form our own views on, for example, China, uh, sure. on uh, Russia, on yep. um, Xi Jinping on yep. even, uh, Julian Assange, although mm -hmm. you better uh, I think we're pretty well aligned on that. Better, but yes, yeah, Xi Jinping yeah. and yeah. Russia, maybe yes, we're not we, completely we, aligned. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And there's, look, there's a range of issues where all of us see through a glass uh, darkly. Uh, yes. Then none of us have Very much so. 2020 a vision. We're all learning. Uh, we are, you know, as uh, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, the original yes. walk on the porch, the Stowe Ark, said we have uh, two uh, ears and one mouth uh, for a reason. We better to listen to each other than, uh, than yeah. to talk. And so I just want to—I I just want to sort of salute and say I'm very honoured to be invited uh, on the slow chat. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much. You've been indulgent towards me. I appreciate your tolerance of my eccentricities and failings, which are obvious uh, and manifold. Uh, but I wish to join, you know, I want to say, even if I'm not here, if I, though I won't be here, you know, on your next one, um, when you bring on, uh, d you know, David Limbrick and Crystal or John Radico or whoever it is, mm -hmm. uh, I want to say that I'm with you in spirit. And I love the I love the enterprise. I feel that we are family, that we are brothers in arms, and whether we uh, succeed or fail, we will uh, go together. And and you feel that because we are. And Ross, you've been an absolute pleasure as a guest, uh, as as a host. There is nothing that you want more than a guest who can hold their own and and make their case. And you have been the absolute epitome of that. I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you. I've enjoyed butting heads with you. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. I hope to repeat this again in another year or so. Perhaps we can do a, a retrospective look back on the federal and the Victorian state elections in another year's time and do a retrospective on that. But, Ross, this has been a pleasure, and I, I'm very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, in fact, at four hours, 29 minutes and 12 seconds at this moment, I believe we may have actually set a new record. I, I'll have to go back and confirm that. But okay. I think we may have actually set a new record. So, Ross All Cameron, right. 
Thank you so much. I applaud you. Thank you for all that you've done for Australia in the past as a member of parliament, as a member of the the uh, journalistic class, uh, what you did on Sky News. Uh, thank you for being fired multiple times because you were fired for all the right reasons. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. And I look forward to chatting with you again in future. Thank you so much. Bless you. All the best. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the comments. It's been an amazing night. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week for another Slow Chat.